Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday, May 4th, 2022 meeting of the Chapel Central School District Board of Education. I will spare you all the Star Wars jokes. Um, the board has been in executive session since 5 o'clock. Um, can I have a motion, please, to re enter the public meeting? All in favor? Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> okay. Um, so spring is in full swing, and there have been a number of wonderful community events this past week that I want to acknowledge. As the CSF liaison, I want to say thank you to the Chapel Schools Foundation for a wonderful annual gala this past Friday night. It was fun and festive and great to connect with people again. Uh, we thank you for all the wonderful work you do for our schools and thank you for a fun evening. I also want to thank the PTA and the Newcastle United for Youth for their joint event, Shine a Life event, to kick off Mental Health Awareness Month. May is Mental Health Awareness Month and I just want to reiterate what was said Sunday night, that mental health is health, and if you or someone you know is struggling, please reach out. There are many resources within this district available to help. So please know that people are here, they want to help, and can help, and will help. So I want to just re-emphasize that message. We have three presentations this evening. We have the budget hearing, the library budget presentation, and then the presentation on the eighth grade math program. I also just want to mention that Kaylee is returning to us tonight from surgery and is still recovering, so we may be taking a few short breaks. I apologize in advance if this lengthens the meeting a bit, but we want to make sure she's comfortable and accommodate her recovery. And Kaylee, we are so glad that you're back. Um, I want to address three other things quickly, because uh, we have a long night. We have wrapped up our parent forums on our DEI work, and I want to acknowledge that some of these groups seem to have run more smoothly than others. It was our intent to have an open dialogue and conversation with respectful disagreement on what people were happy with in areas where parents felt we needed to improve. To anyone who felt like it was not a respectful space, I apologize. It was never our intent for anyone to leave feeling hurt or attacked. We wanted to provide a forum for members of the community to speak with us and share feedback. We still need to hold forums to speak with our students and our faculty, which we will do over the coming weeks. And then we will amalgamate the information we have gathered and discuss how to best move forward with our work around diversity, equity, inclusion, which remains incredibly important to this board and the district. Second, I know there are many parents who are here and watching at home regarding the eighth grade math program. We look forward to the presentation and to, I'm sure, hearing from many of you. I just want to manage expectations and let you know that no decision is going to be made tonight. I'm sure we will be receiving a lot of information and feedback and while I don't want anyone to think we're delaying, we know people want decisions made quickly. We will need time to digest all of this information, including hearing from parents tonight. And I don't want anybody to think that there's going to be a vote or any decisions made tonight. We will, of course, keep the community informed of any changes or decisions and want to let you know there's still plenty of time to make the changes if that is the decision that's made going forward. Lastly, along the lines of timing, we know that parents across the three elementary schools are concerned about fourth grade class sizes. And I promise you that I've assured many people in writing already that the district is keeping an eye on enrollment in this grade and all grades between now and the start of the school year. And if section adjustments need to be made, they will be made. So that's all for me. We've got a lot from other people tonight, so I'm going to pass the baton here. Thank you, Hillary. Okay, so I'm going to very quickly go through the uh, community update and at the end of every meeting I start with our vaccination information. Okay, so you'll be able to see if you are doing our slideshow from home that um, all of our buildings are now above 85%. Um, with some of our schools over 90% in fully vaccinated status. Um, but I do want to share that we've had a pretty significant increase in cases if you compare our positivity rate 
this week compared with last week and certainly the week before. I sent out a notice to our community yesterday so um, parents can um, work with their children to make informed decisions around extracurricular activities, social distancing, and um, mask wearing. Um, I know I received a few emails today from parents asking that the district require students to wear masks. That is not in the guidance right now from the New York State Department of Health. And as we have since the beginning of the pandemic, we have held to that guidance. So at this point, we're not going to make any suggest, uh, shifts in our approach. However, if the Department of Health in Westchester or the New York State Health Department sends out a notification to us um, that would create a situation where we would alter that practice, I'll send that out to the community. Um, but as of Saturday, we have 151 new cases and we've sent out 33 cluster communications across the district. Okay, and at this meeting, I also wanted to provide a brief update regarding the Zotter property that is the, uh, or, or also known as Button Hook. Um, so I just want to just review very quickly that um, the Button Hook property uh, was purchased by the district in 1973 and um, it was decided in July of 2010 that we would begin the process of exploring uh, how to sell that property. And through 2010 and 2015, there were steps taken by the district to uh, work towards presenting the property as a subdivision to the town planning board in an effort to sell it to a developer. And so you can see along the way some action steps that took place. This is all review. I've presented this before to the district. I'd also like to share there were many opportunities for our community to become aware of this process. Um, there, had, there has been at least 40, um, 40 moments in Board of Education record where this was discussed. There's been mailings that have been sent to neighbors in the surrounding area, and there's also been um, meetings that have been held by the district with their neighbors since 2013 all the way up until 2019. Between 2015 and 2019, our, our school district and our engineers appeared before the planning board multiple times to submit documents for them to review. Um, and, and included in this process was two public hearings where anyone could come and make comment on the applications that were presented to the Town Planning Board. And in March of 2019, the Town Planning Board approved a preliminary application um, from the district for a subdivision of six sites. Since that time, we've been working to uh, receive final approval from the Planning Board, but there were steps that needed be, to be taken by the district before that process. One has been concluded in that um, centered on approval from the Westchester Department of Health, but we are still in process of receiving approval to move forward from the DEP, and we've been working on that for approximately a, a year. If the DEP approves our application, then it would be submitted back for final approving to the planning board for consideration. Now, we've had a contract of sale in place for the property since last summer, and um, approvals were needed from the town planning board on or about May 31st, 2020 to complete the sale. Obviously that has not occurred, um, and terms for a contract extension have not yet been determined. Uh, there's been a significant amount of communication to the town planning board and the board of education around potential archeological significance of the property. I just want to share that the Department of, of Environmental Conservation conducted a review of the archaeological resource database during the secret process and didn't find um, any significance prior to the preliminary approval by the town board, and that's when this would have all typically occurred. Um, this report also indicated that the proposed action was not in or adjacent to a historical or archaeological resource. And that I also think it's important to share that should we sell the property, the builder would have obligations to follow New York State reporting requirements should they uncover an item of archaeological significance or remains during the site work. 
And I just would like to share at this time, uh, the district does not intend to engage in any additional review of the site. Okay, so now I just want to transition and allow JB to provide an update on our strategic planning process for special education. Good evening. The special education strategic planning team met again this week. Um, we did meet on April 1st and had a full day together where the work got messy. We were really um, looking at and analyzing and taking apart and thinking about how we would go about the work that was recommended by PCG. At our May 2nd meeting, we looked at all of those work plans again and started to prioritize them. So we are already getting plans in place to present to the board. Jonathan Costa will be here on June 8th to present the action plan to the Board of Education. Thank you, Jane. Um, so we received the Pride Survey Report from the Newcastle United for Youth Coalition. And so while I'm going to present a broad overview tonight for the Board of Education, I, I would like to share with the community that we plan to email out the results in the full report to our 7 through 12 families by this Friday and post this on our website for the entire community. And that um, we will have a, a, a webinar with the town of Newcastle Castle and the district for families on May 25th to we'll go further into the report. Um, but just a general overview, in order for the New Castle United for, for Youth to continue to receive grant funding which supports positions and programming for our schools in the community. Uh, they are required to administer the, the Pride survey to our students and we do that in grades 7 through 12. Um, you can see our survey administration results and we had a 60% response rate uh, at all three le all, all levels that were um, surveyed throughout the district with many of them being over 70%. One of the questions of significance that we asked students by subcategory to identify if they've used um, cigarettes, e-cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, or prescription drugs in the past 30 days, and we found that very few of our middle school students engaged in any kind of behavior that was um, noted in those categories, and that there was an increase in use in all the subcategories between 10th and 12th grade, um, with the exception of e-cigarettes, our 12th grade exceeded um, the national average in those other four subcategories, which is something, of course, we need to think about in our planning for it and how we support our, our, our 12th grade students in their decision making. Um, if you look at our chart, our, the biggest concerns that we have regarding our students' substance use would be alcohol. You'll see that in, um, if you compare our alcohol use against the national average in, in grade 12, and um, in grade 10, it, it exceeded the national average. Um, so obviously that's a, a focus area for us as a district. And of course, there's other areas that we, we remain concerned about around our education for our students, and I'll talk about that in, in, in a minute. Um, but you'll see that alcohol use was significantly higher in grades 10 and 12 compared to the national average. And we also saw um, an increase in our marijuana use for 12th grade students that against the national average. So one of the um, influ influential factors on whether or not students choose to engage in behaviors that are considered risky are the uh, approval factors of their parents and of their friends. So when you look at our percentage of respondents who believe that um, themselves a behavior the behaviors that they are engaging in are risky. You see that tobacco and e-cigarettes and prescription drug use was higher than uh, marijuana and alcohol. And if you look at the parental disapproval rating, you'll see across all subcategories, with the exception of marijuana, students felt in grades 7 through 12 that their parents would um, disapprove of their use of tobacco, e-cigarettes, alcohol, and prescription drugs and in marijuana for the most case, but you saw a decrease in parent disapproval as kids um, uh, became older. And then finally, the perception of friends' disapproval on uh, use of tobacco, e-cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, and prescription drugs, you can see was certainly less than 
their parents' disapproval rate as kids progressing grade levels, and it's important information for you to have because it significantly influences, for, for many students, their um, use of substances outside of the school setting. So our next steps as a district, I'm sorry, let me just go back here, is um, you know we need to share these trends with our faculty and with our students as appropriate, and of course with our parents. They'll help us shape our lessons and our uh, extracurricular work with our with our um, students as they progress in their grade levels. Um, we'll, of course, share these with our advisors and have uh, clubs that focus on uh, working with students and promoting healthy choices. Uh, we also um, will use this to inform our SEL work. And um, I think most importantly, we need to uh, work with our parents to help shape student behavior outside of school because we're very few incidents of students needing to be addressed in school for any of these subcategories. That includes um, e-cigarettes this year, and we've seen a significant decrease in our interaction with students around um, vaping since we've come back from the pandemic. So before we move into the budget presentation, I just want to highlight some of the events that we have coming up. So of course we're in AP testing right now. We are starting to have our um, kindergarten parent orientations. Our students starting on May 9th, our seniors will be out on their experiences. Uh, we have uh, our concerts that are starting. We have our career day coming up in Seven Bridges and in Bell. Um, we have our West Richard Theater performances the weekend of the 14th. And then, of course, we have our budget vote on May 17th. And, and, then, and again, we have our concerts continuing. Um, and so you'll see in May, our high school, our high school teachers are beginning their uh, end of year shows for our students. So. That's the end of the community update, and I want to um, transition over to Andrew, who will present the district's um, budget here this evening for the community. So, we thank, you. thank you, Dr. Thank you, So I know we have a lot to cover, and we've been over these slides several times, so I'll try to move quickly, but if I need to slow down, please let me know. Um, so, yeah, there we go. Speaking of Michael, sorry, that 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 okay. Um, so, our uh, approved our uh, post budget for 2022 23 is $133,963,411. It represents a $3.5 million increase versus the current year and a 2.69% uh, increase. The um, board's strategic questions. Uh, are listed here, as well as the uh, next slide, which has the strategic planning uh, information that the district has done in the past. Those, those two um, documents are, have really helped guide this budget making process. Um, and I will jump right into the financials. Um, so, so this slide, again, shows the, the trend of our budgets year over year. Um, my eyes are not as good as they once were, so I'm going to use my screen to see it. Um, you'll see the blue bars are the budget numbers, and the yellow bars are our tax levy. Um, and then the increases um, are represented in the line graphs there. And our current budget proposal is 2.69% increase, and our levy is 2.79%. In terms of expenditures, our largest increases from a percentage perspective are in special education, uh, mostly services, and technology. As I've talked about in previous budget presentations, um, those are really driven by specific needs for the district. Uh, special education, obviously, driven by IEPs and student needs uh, for students with disabilities. Um, so tuition and, and contract services are the largest piece that are growing in that area based on the needs we project for our students. Um, in terms of BOCES services, there are several um, services that we subscribe to with BOCES, which may have been included in other parts of the budget in the past. I consolidated them into, into the BOCES uh, line. And then technology. Um, Dr. Block was here tonight, um, presented clearly that technology is, is core to our instruction now. We've got some technology infrastructure improvements that we've factored in here, as well as cybersecurity needs because of the, the growing threat um, in every business in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, the next slide really shows the budget as a percentage of the overall budget. And um, though we have some large increases in other areas, salary and benefits by far are the largest piece of our budget. Um, and they make up approximately 72.5% uh, of the budget in the coming school year. Uh, sorry, 72% 72, 72 in the current school year. Um, in terms of revenues, um, we have to present a balanced budget, 
right? So our revenue sources are listed here, the largest piece being our property taxes, followed uh, by state aid, um, and the increases there I've described in previous uh, presentations. Um, but the important thing to know is this is a tax cap compliant budget. So we, we've gone to the tax cap and a simple majority vote is, is required to have this budget approved. Um, this is a breakdown of, of where those percentages are uh, as part of the overall budget. Inflation continues to be a concern. Um, even today, the Fed announced increases in interest rates. Um, so we are watching that closely. This does drive uh, some of the costs for commodities, for fuel, for various different um, parts of our, our budget. So we are concerned about that significantly, especially in the era of tax cap, where we are, the calculation that reflects CPI is capped at 2%, though CPI might be actually a little bit higher. Um, this is the full calculation of the tax cap. Um, again, I, I won't go through the details. It is um, a challenge, especially at the size font that's on that screen. Um, but we are taking into account our capital exclusions for the coming school year and our debt service payments, and that is um, added to our, our current levy as a property growth uh, for the factor that is issued by the controller's office. So, in total, the, the cap is uh, 3.173 million. In terms of what we're allowed to go up to, and still have a simple majority, and we are going to use that um, and not anymore. Um, if the budget were to fail, the tax cap law does require us uh, to do one of two things to either adopt a, an alternative uh, budget and bring it to the voters, um, or to go to a contingent budget. A contingent budget would mean that the levy would have to be flat. So um, if we were to go with a contingent budget because the budget fails, um, then we would have to find reductions of 3.173 million uh, to make the, the balanced budget happen for next year. And there's no doubt, if you refer to my previous slides, um, salary and benefits certainly would be a major component in making that, uh, that budget balance. And the budget notice is a prescribed um, format that is issued by the state. That is going to be in our newsletter that will be going out in the coming days. And it, um, outlines the um, proposed budget as well as the current year's budget and what would uh, happen with a contingent budget reduction. And this is also, again, part of the prescribed uh, form for New York State. Uh, on the bottom right, you'll see that the STAR um, exemption is capped at $1,702. That, again, comes from the Office of Real Property Taxes, and we have to show this on here. There are no other propositions on our uh, upcoming budget vote, so there's nothing listed there for that vote. In terms of tax rates, the uh, proposed budget, uh, based on the information we had at the time of, of the, the budget being presented, um, would result in a tax uh, rate of $115.93 for um, Newcastle and $1,715 for Mount Pleasant. Um, there's equalization rates and property assessment differences, which is why those numbers look so drastically different. Um, but they are uh, representing a 1.78% increase for the town of Newcastle and 8.21% increase for town of Pleasant properties. And we are moving quickly through our presentation here. Uh, again, tax cap compliant budget. Um, the budget is going up 2.69% and the levy is going up 2.79%. And we have um, really Highlighted, you know, too far. highlighted kind of the key pieces of our budget that we need to walk away with. Um, it's been responsive to the strategic questions and, and the um, strategic coherence plan um, that the board has, has worked on. Um, it meets the operating standards for 2023 school year that we um, have established at the beginning of our budget making process. We are supporting social emotional needs of our students maintaining robust instructional program, um, investing in our technology, which I mentioned is core now to our instruction in the district, um, and we've uh, adjusted personnel based on enrollment changes projected for the coming year. As Dr. Ackerman and, and uh, Ms. Grosso said at the beginning of the meeting, we will continue to monitor that throughout the summer, and, uh, and we are below the tax cap. In terms of voter information, um, Ms. Elsner, our district clerk, it's available to, to uh, answer any questions about voter information. Um, to be eligible to vote 
on May 17th, the residents must be registered. Um, so we need to make sure we let you know that. And the, you can register to vote at the district office up until May 12th, uh, any time until May 12th, which is five days prior to the budget vote. Details. Um, again, it's hard to read on the screen here. I won't read through. We've got a lot to go through. Um, members of the school board. We've got three open seats. We've got several candidates that are running, um, including some of our city board members who are returned. And that is all to be outlined in our budget newsletter, which will be going out in the coming days. And we're reaching the end of our checkmark uh, slide. So um, the budget was adopted on April sixth. Do our budget hearing this evening, and the library budget will be following, and then we have the budget vote on May 17th. So, because this is the budget hearing at this point, we, we need it's appropriate for us to take any uh, final comments from the community on the budget before we close the hearing. So, you'd have to come up to the microphone and you would limit your comments to three minutes, and it's not a QA. Citizens that want to know what the budget is. 
We rely on you, the, the board, to help us. Thank, Thank you very much. Hi, Dana Rosenberg. I have three children uh, in the Chappaqua School District, one of each school. Thank you very much, Mr. Lennon, for the presentation. I know how much work that takes, and so very, very appreciative. One of the pieces of information, and maybe I just missed it because you were having run through it so quickly, is the percentage per student that we are spending on all of these items. Um, as a parent of an incoming fourth grader, yes, class size is definitely on my mind. One of my questions, especially coming out of the pandemic, where many of our kids lost a year and a half to two years of the wonderful education that Chappaqua provides, how are we planning to make that up? And therefore, what are we spending our money on as a percentage of student? And so I don't know if that was in the presentation and I just missed it, or we don't present that information, but to me that's a really, really interesting point of data that I would like to see in future presentations. Thank you. Hi, Jocelyn Herman. Um, I also have three kids in the district, 11th, 8th, and 3rd, also of an incoming fourth grade student. Um, and I am extremely disappointed in the board's response to the parents' concern over class size. Can you please step closer to my Sorry. Um, I am extremely concerned about the board's lack of response to the incoming fourth grade of next year. Um, this year, my daughter has, in third grade, almost, I think she has 25 kids in her class, one from 24 to 25 in the middle of the year. They, as Dana pointed out, just came off of losing a year and a half of a critical time, first and second grade, where you learn to read, you learn to communicate with your friends. It's in elementary school, I think of the three schools that's blown up the most. For kids, they have 24 kids and 25 kids in their class. And now next year, you guys are just dismissing it and saying, oh yeah, we're having 25 kids. We're at the cap, it doesn't matter, we're not over union rules, but yet, and we'll, we'll monitor in the summer. However, monitoring in the summer, we've seen this happen a few years ago. In, in Grafton, I believe um, this gentleman is actually the principal at the time. When you change a class in the summer, when you add a class in the summer, should we get so lucky that you should decide to give us this class with our tax cap? It's not the same. The, the teachers are right now going through the process of forming classes. The teachers, the principal, the parent input, it's all formulated, as we're told, to give really, you know, classes that are really well thought out, to spread out any trouble, to match teachers with kids. Now if you decide to monitor the situation over the summer and add a six class, at that point you're basically pulling kids from each class, from you know five kids from each class and formulating a six class. That's not the right answer. And if I if my tax money is going up by this much, I'm actually not pleasant, so I guess I'm getting increased eight percent versus the one percent of Newcastle. I want to see my incoming fourth grader not with 25 kids in the class. I expect so much more of Chappaqua. My middle schooler doesn't have that, my high schooler doesn't have that, and the little kids need more one-on-one -on -one attention than 25 kids in a class. Thank you. Hello, my name is Evelyn Bradstrom. I have one son in Santa Bridges. Um, I wanted to address the comment I heard. I think I understood about uh, regarding button poverty. Poverty. I'm, yes. I'm sorry. I, I have to stop. And I don't. Mean Go ahead. To, I don't mean to be rude at all. Um, the hearing itself has to be directly related to the budget, and then so maybe you have a budget question. So I, if, mm -hmm. if it's related to this presentation, it's totally fine. If not, it just has to be for public comment. So thank you. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so that would, uh, if there's no other comments, uh, that'll conclude the comment period of the budget hearing. So that brings us to the public library budget presentation, which before um, Andrew Barber presents, Andrew presents, right? 
Yeah, he's here. He's here. Oh, so great. Come on up, Andrew. Before Andrew presents, I have been asked to read a letter um, from Liz Hansen, the president of the Chapel Central School District Library and their board of trustees. So I'm going to read um, Ms. Hansen's letter into the record because she's unable to be here. So she writes, Dear Board of Education, thank you for hosting the Chapel Central School District Library this evening and giving us an opportunity to present the 2022-2023 library budget to the community. I am unfortunately unable to join. Our director, Andrew Farber, will give tonight's project presentation. Questions may be directed to chaboard at wlsmail.org, and I'm sure that is an email that will be part of this presentation. Um, the Chappaqua Library Board of Trustees approved this budget unanimously. A board-led committee works closely with Andrew over several months to comb through the details of the library's operating and capital needs, and the entire board reviewed and provided feedback at our monthly board meetings. The budget takes care of our staff and community while being fiscally responsible to taxpayers. Following this presentation, a budget mailer will be sent to the community. We look forward to the vote on May 17th and to seeing you at the library. Sincerely, Ms. Hamson, President of the Library Board. Turn it over to Andrew. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting the library to the budget uh, hearing tonight. I just wanted to share a little background about the library. This is our centennial year. We're celebrating our 100th anniversary. Uh, we'll be having a celebration in June. Um, so we'd like to thank the community for their support of the library over the last 100 years and uh, their continued support as we move into the future. Uh, this past budget year has had many challenges for the library uh, with COVID-19 and the pandemic taking a, making drastic changes required to the library. Um, during the pandemic, we introduced curbside pickup and worked diligently to provide material to the community. Uh, this proved so popular that we have continued to, to this day, um, and it's another way to facilitate access to library materials and uh, for our community. We're going to continue to add uh, to our current materials uh, to the collection, provide entertaining and educational programs, focusing on partnerships with organizations such as the Chappaqua Garden Club, Newcastle Historical Society, Lincoln Cell Center, Miller House, and others. Despite limited space and access due to construction and pandemic, uh, the library circulated over 91,000 print materials, over 12,000 audiovisual materials, and over 108,000 electronic materials. We also offered 680 programs uh, that were either attended or viewed virtually by over 27,000 uh, patrons. The expansion of our children's room, young adult room, bathrooms, and study rooms were completed and celebrated last fall. Uh, we thank the Friends of the Chapel Library for funding the technology in the future. Uh, however, our building is over 50 years old, and the ex original exterior of the building is currently in need of refurbishment. Funds have been allocated in our 2022-2023 budget to maintain, repair, and enhance the library environment. We also have immediate and near-term construction uh, projects Tropical Storm Ida modified the stream channels, uh, the streams channel and caused flooding damage to the library property. Uh, we have the following projects uh, as priority for our library. There are our parking lot and outdoor spaces, our stream channel management and natural disaster mitigation, and our theory. Uh, let me go back. This year we are proposing a budget of uh, $3,454,254, which is an increase of 3.01%. This is a total increase of $101,015, which comes in under the tax cap uh, maximum increase of $120,074. As with the school, the majority uh, of our increase has come from salaries and benefits, benefits increased significantly uh, in the past year. We are proposing to increase the uh, library materials budget and provide additional electronic materials. 
We have been able to, however, provide a savings in our operating expenses, primarily through uh, increased efficiencies and partnering with the Westchester Library System for our technology needs. We are anticipating increasing our capital, uh, capital reserve from $90,000 to $95,000 to help facilitate those, the construction projects. Overall, our uh, expenditures for personnel are at $2,686,156, which is a 3.9% increase. Our materials budget is $183,923, which is a 4.2% increase. And our operating expenses are $489,166, uh, which is a negative 2.3% increase. As Andrew mentioned, uh, we are under our tax cap as the school is. Our tax cap calculation worksheet is here. It is a little bit complicated, but as I mentioned, our uh, maximum tax levy increase was $120,704, and we are coming in below that. Our tax analysis uh, for 2022-2023 uh, shows an increase rate for $1,000 for Newcastle, $3.40, and for Mount Pleasant, $50.25. Uh, that is respectively a 2% increase for Newcastle and a 8.44% increase for Mount Pleasant. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this time. I have a question. How are we doing uh, with the uh, how, are we doing, how are we doing meetings wise? I know we had some issues or some concerns about the roof, and if you guys work on that, can you give us an update on that? Absolutely. We were able to successfully complete a full roof restoration by using the liquid roof uh, technology. Uh, this actually came in on time and under budget. Uh, so we have, at this point, ended all our leaks, which we are very, very happy for. Um, and have a, a very nice new roof that's also more energy efficient due to its reflection, which we are told should lower our energy costs in the summer for the Great, thank you. On time on your budget, it's wonderful. Yes. Great, thank you, Andrew. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Have a wonderful Good evening. Night. Okay, so uh, I'd like to welcome Josh Hubble Clark. And Adam Peace, who will now um, provide a overview of our eighth grade algebra program to the Board of Education. Thank you, Christine. Um, so, as Christine mentioned, we're going to um, present some information on the eighth grade algebra program. Um, just in terms of how we've organized the presentation tonight, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the history and enrollment trends. Um, give you a program summary and kind of belief system around the program. Um, we're going to do a little curriculum side by side so people can see, the board can see the eighth grade program compared to the algebra program. Um, Josh is going to summarize some algebraic thinking skills and then talk a little bit about the instructional model, how we support all students, whether they might need some additional support or some um, enrichment. Um, talk a little bit about high school pathways and, and share what is in the decisions booklet with regard to choices that students and parents make. Um, and we're going to share quite a bit of data. Um, we have some data pre-pandemic from when we had the two-class model as well as the um, data from the model now. Um, and talk a little bit about feedback and adjustments and recommendations for next steps. Um, I, I will um, say that we're not here to sell the program or to defend any decisions that we made. We're really here to just provide information um, to have you know a, a discussion and continued discussions about um, decisions going forward, and, and hopefully we'll be able to make the best decision for our, for our students. I know um, that parents have come out and, and would like to, you know, contribute during public comment, and certainly the board has questions. So um, we're going to try to provide a, a real foundational presentation that will facilitate and, and support that conversation. 
Right, so just in terms of, of history and enrollment trends, and I know for some of you this might be new information, and for many of you, you know this, but just as a reminder, um, prior to or up to 2017-18, we had exa entrance exams, we had two different courses, we had a math 8 course and we had an enriched algebra course. Um, there was an entrance exam with criteria, there was kind of a cut score or cut off, um, and certain students were admitted to the program and others um, were not admitted to the program. We opened enrollment for 2018-19 and 2019-20. Um, and that's when we started to see a shift of enrollment. I'm going to share some of that data in just a minute, but we continue to run Math 8 um, and Enriched Algebra, and we kind of flip flop from like a 60-40 to a 40-60 with um, about two-thirds of students in Enriched Algebra, algebra in 1920. Um, 2021 was the year of the um, pandemic. We had um, Algebra 8, that was the first year of it. Um, th that was when we had the cohorts, we had remote learners, um, we were teaching um, ELA and math in large spaces. Um, you know, we, we were able to get all of our students in every day during this time, which was a, a unique um, situation and something we're really proud of, I know, um, but it didn't come without challenges. And it, it, it forced us to make a decision where if we continue to run, we, we basically had to decide if we had students come in every other day, we could continue to run our master schedule with the two courses. Um, we decided it would bring students in every day. One of the sacrifices that we had to make or decisions we had to make was around the math courses because we were getting guidance from the Department of Health at the time that we shouldn't be mix, mixing and remixing the students. So if we were to continue with an advanced math course in eighth grade, those students would be cohorted all through their subjects through the day. And that was something we didn't want to do. And that, so then we were kind of pressed into this decision of algebra. Um, in eighth grade for all students in 2021. That was during the pandemic, and obviously this year we have um, Algebra 8. We have made some shifts, so there's 53 minute classes. Those classes were shortened during the um, 2021 school year, um, and you can see some other adjustments which we'll talk more about in just a minute. Um, I did want to share that um, we have heard from the community, we've had questions about the level of communication, and this is a list, although I know it's, it's very a text heavy slide. Um, it is a list of communications that we had between March of 2021 and April 2022. These were all letters that we sent out to parents, as well as um, focus group surveys, um, webinars, etc. Um, and I understand that all of these did not go out to the whole community. Some were targeted towards seventh grade parents, others towards eighth grade parents and students, etc. Um, but I did want to share that um, communications. This is a graph just showing that enrollment trend shift, um, where blue is the enriched algebra, and you can see that increase over time. Um, up to that 2019-20 bar all the way there on the right. And I, I anticipate that that shift would have continued um, had it not been for COVID and us shifting the model. Um, and it is of, of concern, one of the things that was could have potentially pushed us in this direction anyway is the makeup of that red bar and which students are there and what that trend looks like over time and how small does that class get and who is in that class of math eight while the majority of students are in enriched algebra. So just a summary of the, of the Math 8 program, um, all 8th grade students take Algebra 8, um, students are supported through enrichment um, throughout the year, all students take the New York State Algebra Regents exam, and they also take the Math 8 assessment. And when they do that, then we count the Math 8 assessment, and by count, it's just part of the New York State accountability system, we have to count a Math 8 assessment during the 8th grade, and by also taking the Algebra exam, that counts as their high school exam as part of the New York State um, school accountability requirements, and that frees the students up then from having to take a Regents exam at Greeley, which gives the um, high school math department a lot more freedom with regard to course design because they're not locked in to take a Regents exam. Some students will go on and choose to take the Algebra Regents again, in which case we'll replace on their transcript whichever score is higher on the Algebra Regents. Um, students receive high school algebra credit and are exempt from the geometry regions, as I said. All right, so just a, a little um, overview, kind of a program comparison side by side um, with the two core system, Math 8 and Enriched Algebra. You know, it was more in line with the regional norm. You find that in schools that are similar to us in the area. It gave um, students and parents more choice and an uh, increased feeling of fit. Um, there's really two options there. If we have an en entrance criteria like we had previously, um, we have concerns about the validity of that criteria. It's, it's historically challenging to predict success of middle school students in any subject. So when you start to put together criteria of using entrance exams or, or averages in courses, um, it's, it's invariably unpredictable. Um, and it does provide for both of them, um, provides this idea of inequity and tracking um, very early on. And then as we add the, the second, the current system, one course system is algebra, you can see the, the positives um, 
the five years of high school math um, is available to all students. More students have the opportunity to potentially take calculus as seniors. It does delay that tracking decision until high school, um, so they have time to develop their algebraic thinking. It keeps uh, heterogeneous groups through the middle school as opposed to tracking them into the two different tracks and supports um, equity and inclusion because all students have then the opportunity for five years of math. Uh, and some concerns, you know, the level of rigor with regard to fit for students, is it too rigorous or not rigorous enough? Um, challenges with differentiation in that heterogeneous group and a feeling where students or, or parents or, or a faculty member may feel there is not a good fit and another option um, in the course. So these are, these are some of our guiding principles, um, and I understand that everyone won't necessarily agree with these things, but um, the, you know, I, I believe that early tracking disadvantages more students than it helps. Um, when it comes to middle school tracking, I think early tracking has a, a disproportionate and negative impact and too often a predictable negative impact on certain populations of students. Um, I think access to rigor matters for all students. Um, access to five years of high school math matters for students. We hear that from colleges repeatedly. Um, access to a strong algebra curriculum is a key indicator for future mathematical success. So focus on eighth grade algebra I think is a, a good choice as opposed to some of the other topics in eighth, eighth grade math. Um, and early selection systems are not predictive and are therefore inherently unfair um, when it comes to middle school tracking, early middle school tracking systems. All right, so our, like, what's our goal for this program? I've been asked that um, by community members. And so here is what we're trying to accomplish, a more equitable, more equitable access to advanced rigorous coursework, delay the high stakes, high pressure decisions of choosing a track, which um, students had to previously do in seventh grade, um, rigorous eighth grade math program for all students, and then maximum student growth. That's what we we're trying to accomplish, trying to avoid this fixed mindset communication about who's good at math and who's not good at math, um, early high stakes decisions. We're trying to avoid a high, high ability track and low ability track with predictable inequities, as I mentioned. Um, and trying to avoid this kind of high stress, high stakes um, decisions that would have to happen pretty early on. All right, so Josh, I'm gonna transition over. We're gonna do some research on algebra. So starting with um, looking at some national re research about algebra, and this study talks about how um, a strong foundation in algebra for all students is the highest predictor of longitudinal success in mathematics and sciences um, over the course of high school and college. And then that another piece of research showing us that starting to track students early um, it starts to lead to lower mindsets of students and develops this idea of a fixed mindset of students that are in lower tracks um, feel like they can't do math. It also, this study showed that achievement was linked to this early tracking um, and also talked about how student mindset was linked to early tracking as well as students not being able to catch up in curriculum from this early tracking. So they were constantly falling behind over the course of their high school career in math. So next we want to talk about comparing uh, math eight curriculum versus algebra. So one of the things to notice is that um, math eight, there's a lot of text on this slide, but the, the crux of it is that there is a large overlap in math eight and algebra curriculum. And that's on purpose. Um, the state has said that there are ways to have students take both math eight and algebra at the same time. So you have a large, um, a large overlap. We have, consciously thought about that and thought about what math eight topics can be taught in seventh grade and what topics in seventh grade can be taught in sixth grade. And this is actually all supported by our math and focus K-5 implementation, which has always gone over and above the common core standards of each grade level. So the most important thing that we have talked about in the research and in our principles is that algebraic thinking is a skill that students need to see and understand that we all use in our daily life every single day. Um, and having a, a eighth grade algebra experience and an in-depth algebra experience is really important to have students developing their algebraic thinking skills. But it doesn't start in eighth grade. We don't start teaching students algebra when they get to eighth grade when they take a formalized algebra course. The question that we have up here is a question that is in our third grade math and focus curriculum, 
as well as essentially comes back in our algebra curriculum. The only difference between the two at that point is that we start to formalize the variables and use letters for those variables. But you can see that the red boxes are a version of us teaching students this variable thinking um, before they even get to algebra. <coughs> Um, and then, this is a, a large text from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, but it, it really talks about how important algebraic thinking is. Um, and it, it also shows us that in chapter bar, our use of a concrete sort of tutorial to an abstract algebra method of teaching, beginning as early as kindergarten, first and second grade, really supports the idea that we are developing algebraic thinkers in our curriculum. The other core component of an algebra program is the develop of functional thinking. So the idea that there is an output by doing something to an input and looking at those patterns is the core piece of developing from algebra to geometry to trigonometry and then up to calculus. So this is a, re a large core component of our algebra curriculum. So I want to talk about our instructional model. Um, and it doesn't mirror what we think of as a traditional math classroom that probably looked like when we took algebra back in middle school or high school. Um, the, the first piece of it is we each class starts each day with an activation. Um, these activations have what we call a low floor and a high ceiling. They have entry points for every student in the class. You might have a student that asks which one doesn't belong and say that the negative three because there's no X attached to it. Or you might have a student say the negative three X squared because it's a quadratic expression, right? So you have lots and lots and lots of different options for students to be participating and engaging from the second that they walk into a classroom. Rather than doing a problem from the homework from the night before, it's questions that can engage all students. Another one here is a same but different. So students are asked to use their whiteboards at their desks or on vertical whiteboards in the classroom to just simply look at these problems and say, what is the same about them and what is different about them? You do see lots of students starting to solve these quadratic equations. You do see students looking at them in ways that say one is on one side, one is on another side. Um, but you have lots and lots and lots of different entry points for all different types of learners in the classroom from the second they walk in. Um, a big piece of the core instructional component of our classes is whiteboarding. Um, using whiteboards, using vertical whiteboards and horizontal whiteboards takes the, um, takes the formality out of taking notes in a classroom. It allows students to feel like they can be creative. It allows them to feel like they can erase anything that they need to revise, um, and it also allows a teacher to be walking around a room and very easily see where every single student in their class is at and what exactly they are doing to be able to formally assess their students in their class to make decisions in the moment of how to proceed to the next activity in the classroom. Um, we, this work um, is done by Peter Liliendahl. He has um, we, have, we have read his book, we have done, looked at his research, and we've really implemented a lot of his work around taking students into a growth mindset for mathematics, looking at lots of different assessment methods, um, and allowing students to really grow at their own pace, rather than us standing at the front of the room and teaching them mathematical concepts, but rather having them to develop their own mathematical learning. Um, our approach to homework has been in two different ways. One is every homework assignment that's on paper that has gone home with our students has an A level, a B level, a C level. Generally, we have students do the B level and choose if they want to go and do the A level work to either review what happened in the previous class to then develop their learning or do enrichment work that would be the C level. Um, we have students, some of them come in and do all three levels. We have some that do just the A level. We have some that do the C and the B level and, and every permutation. Um, and that alone is a way for a teacher to assess their students in their class. Um, we also utilize a program called Delta Math, 
um, which teachers can assign different problem sets to students. So um, each student in the class doesn't necessarily get the same problem set. They could get problem sets that really are um, targeted towards their learning needs. Um, and it also has options for students to practice additional work. It also, they get instant feedback. Um, and the teacher has fine-tuned controls over what students see what type of work. Um, and all of this leads to, as opposed to lots of whole group instruction, where essentially a teacher is either lecturing or developing the same thing for the entire class, our students are working in small groups in lots and lots and lots of times during their class. I've walked into classes and I see some students working independently, while a teacher is coaching into another group, um, while another group of students are working um, at, at, as a group with the work that they're doing. So the idea of that is that a teacher can think about a unit or a skill that they are teaching in terms of a band of learning for students, and can start to work with the various students that are in their class to decide, okay, this group needs to work on this piece of mathematics, this group needs to work on this piece of mathematics, um, and then at times they will mix up the different groups and start to do some collaborative learning with all of them. Um, and this is all actually in this verse with um, some short bursts of whole class instruction. If you walk into our rooms, you see lots of anchor charts around the map that summarizes the work that's going on in that unit. Um, you see lots of student work on walls. Um, and you see lots of students being actively engaged from the beginning of the class all the way through until the end of the period. Um, we want to talk about the assessment model that our teachers are using to learn how our students are doing in class um, utilizes summative assessments, right? So students do take tests um, in, in these classes at the end of the units and quizzes throughout. Um, but everything that I just outlined is a method for teachers to assess the learning of our students and decide what, to, what gets taught the next day, what gets taught in that class, um, and how to guide the homework for the students and how to guide any individualized um, support that students need. So it's a multi-tiered assessment model. So I think this is an important slide to spend a little time on for us to, to talk about. Um, we have built in um, many supports with the resources of the school district and the resources of our faculty in order to provide an environment that really is multi-tiered and differentiated um, throughout the classroom. So starting with everything that I just outlined about differentiation and leveled activities in the classroom to utilizing our STEAM teachers, um, Tabitha and Jenny, pushed into the math classrooms. Um, we have extra help after school for our students. We also have AIS um, support for students that need it. Um, our special education teachers have been part of the professional learning around mathematics from the beginning of this year um, and have really been huge, huge, huge supports when they're consultant teaching in the classrooms with the teachers that they're working in with and also working in learning centers and in a variety of places with to support our students and our ENL teachers as well. Um, we have done a considerable amount of professional learning with our faculty, um, including learning walks, including coaching sessions, um, including reviewing our curriculum, assessment, development, homework development, um, and, and really over the course of this year, fine-tuning the instructional model. So there, have been, there are many supports that we built into year two of our algebra program. We also have built in lots of safety nets. So students at the end of eighth grade can decide to take algebra again in high school. Um, we have two courses that they can take that would replace the eighth grade score on their transcript, as well as allowing them to have the highest of their region score, algebra scores on their transcript. Um, students can receive, uh, receive credit with a 65 or higher, or if they're a student with a disability of 55 or higher on their regions. Um, and it also 
allows us to be free from future math regions exams, having the students take the algebra regions in eighth grade, which this examination, the regions examination, is a high school graduation requirement. So this, um, we, we, we talk about how the eighth grade assessment generally is more challenging than the algebra regions, since this is a New York State graduation requirement. So that frees us up from into high school um, for students to have to take another regions exam. Um, so just to, to talk about the enrichment that has been happening in class, we've already talked about level homework um, and differentiated homework that students have and the differentiated activities. Um, our STEAM teachers have been doing push in and pull out enrichment. Um, it, just a couple weeks ago, one of the activities they were having them uh, an enrichment pull out with our STEAM teachers was modeling a ball launcher and learning about vertical motion. So the students were learning how to use quadratic regression to model what the pathway that the ball that they launched took, that they took pictures of, and then put onto their computers and, and model that. So, so they've been doing a lot of enrichment work. Um, and we also want to make sure that we highlight our Science Olympiad Club, our STEAM clubs, um, and our Math Counts Club that students are taking. Traditionally, um, these are the two pathways that students would take through their high school math experience. Um, if they took Math 8, you'd see Algebra, Geometry, Trigonometry, and Pre-Calculus. And if you took Algebra in 8th grade, um, you'd take Geometry, Trigonometry, Pre-Calculus, and Calculus. Um, those are the traditional standard math sequences that high schools generally take. Um, because of having algebra in eighth grade. I know this slide is hard to read, has lots of information on it, um, but it allows lots and lots of different options for students once they enter high school. So they don't get locked into a track and they have options to move throughout tracks. I know there are solid lines here, but many of these courses have dotted lines for students to move throughout. And by having them take algebra in eighth grade, it gives them more opportunities to move through tracks as they develop through high school and as they develop as learners. Um, I want to review what the ninth grade courses that are available to our students for incoming freshmen. So the one of the courses are algebraic thinking courses. The first one is Essentials of Algebra which is for students that really need to take a second year of algebra, or they need to brush up on their, on their algebra skills before they enter into a geometry course. Um, that course is entirely structured around algebra. Um, the next course that also students have the option to take the regions at the end of is our Cornerstones of High School Mathematics course. And that's for students who would like to take more algebraic thinking, would like to learn more about their algebraic thinking and build their skills, but also would like to start to build their geometry skills to then enter into our geometry course or our enriched geometry course. Um, so both of those courses end in um, a regions, the option of a regions exam that can then replace their eighth grade scores from their high school transcripts. Typically, we see the majority of our students taking either geometry or enriched geometry. So these is best for students who have been successful in Algebra 8, um, and it encompasses the majority of our students. And then the last course, the fifth course that's an option, is our Math 9 Honors course, which is the course that students would take Calc BC as juniors. Um, and this is for our really our highest achieving students, our students who do incredibly well in Algebra 8. Um, it's based on teacher recommendation and also their, their scores in Algebra 8. Um, and again, and that takes them through um, basically through Calc BC as a junior and then in advanced topics in college mathematics as seniors. So as we go into some of the data that we pulled, I want to start with just some of the challenges and our thinking around data validity. Um, 
and it's particularly challenging as we look at some of the sources that we traditionally use, like this is the section of, so, so does this work, and who does it work for, like who's learning, um, and how do we know? Um, and so we think about using the New York 3 through 8 assessments, we're shifting the curriculum, so we're not teaching that math 8 curriculum, so it's hard to compare the math 8 scores of before to now, because that's not our focus and not our curriculum. And in addition, the exam wasn't given in 1920, and, and last year we even recycled some questions. So some students had used some practice questions I presented and shared that with the board. So that's a challenge. The Regents exam, we will have um, Regents scores obviously at the end of this year, um, but we don't have them yet. And you know, to compare cohorts, we were only giving that Regents exam to a select group of students, and now we're giving it to all students. So it makes it challenging to do like a pre and a post um, assessment using the Regents exam, and then the to use course grades or course averages or, or test grades, we've redesigned the course and the assessment system in a way that makes it challenging to compare pre and post. So um, what we do have, and it's, it's fortunate that we do, is we have the NWEA MAPS data. And the MAPS assessment is not designed to be an algebra assessment. It's designed to be a mathematics assessment, and it'll measure achievement and growth. So what this slide shows is that this is when we gave them the MAPS assessment to the students. Um, unfortunately, we gave it in the fall and winter pre-COVID in 2019-20. So that's our previous model. We have data from the fall and from the winter. And so by having those two measures, we have a like a growth um, measure for 1920 with the traditional you know two-track model. Then we have the cohorts of so that was the pandemic year there in the middle. We gave it fall, winter, spring, but so we can compare again fall and winter. Um, and then we have this year's fall and winter, we haven't yet given the spring assessment. So this does give us a standard, and this is a nationally normed test, and the national norm does not change over time, so we can compare our students to that national norm. Um, and then, like I said, it's not an algebra test specifically, it's just that we can get an overall sense of how students are doing mathematically. Um, our students are used to, or I'm sorry, our parents are used to seeing these reports um, because we upload them up into the backpack, and one of the nice things about the MAPS assessment is it gives us both a, a growth score as well as an achievement score. So you can see students that may be high growth but low achievement or high achievement but low growth. You can see both of those measures on, on a student's report. Um, and it also the MAPS score, parents, parents are familiar with this because we also upload this chart into the backpack um, and they can see their student tracking along this um, trajectory and they break students down into subgroups which will share some data here in just a minute. Um, so this is our, our first chart. I think Josh is going to talk us through this one. Yeah, so Adam had talked about it. We're, you're going to see charts that either have growth on them or have achievement on them or both. So this first chart has our winter 2022 MAPS assessment. Um, and you can see here it's broken out into quintiles that our eighth grade cohort has the highest group that is high achieving of any of our middle school students. So you can see the green and the orange bars are the highest, where our low, low average, and average are the, some of the lowest of our students in, in there. So, so it's a good thing, it's skewed to the right, it's a good thing in this case. The higher that right side is, the better, the more achievement you're getting out of that particular grade at that time, in this case, winter 22. Great. So in this one, you see, this is our fall to winter growth. Um, and this is how much in our current program um, students are growing in, within the instruction that they're having from early fall to, to midwinter. Um, and you can see in eighth grade, the growth, um, the green and the orange bars, right, in our high average and our high, those are the highest bars of any of our four grade levels in middle school. And on the left side, where we see the blue and the red, those are the lowest bars. So we are seeing that students are growing at a very high rate in our eighth grade classes as compared to our fifth, sixth, and seventh grade classes. Um, here we did a comparison of the achievement of fall and winter um, from 1920, right, which was pre-pandemic, and then 2021, and then 21-22. Um, you can see here, again, the growth average has gone up substantially with, in, in all three years, um, and with our 
stratified model in 1920, in algebra year one in 2021, and then algebra year two in 2021-22. Um, you can see that the scores of the achievement um, are lower coming into that. We could attribute that to our, what we talked about earlier, our class sizes in seventh grade being shorter and in large rooms. Um, but we, we see the growth in this year to be the highest and well exceeding the norm grade level, which is the internationalized norm that MAPS sets um, based upon all of the data that they've had from their studies of students in eighth grade that have taken the MAPS assessment. So I think if we had only one slide to share with you, this would probably be the one that we share. And, and I say that because in 2019-20, the average RIT growth for Chapel Class students in eighth grade was a 0.6. The norm should be three, right? So the, the national norm should be three RIT points. Um, with algebra for all students in 2021, despite the challenges of short, of smaller, um, or, I'm sorry, cohorts in cafeterias and gymnasiums, um, some students learning remotely and shortened classes. We shortened classes to I think 42 minutes from 55. Um, we still got an increase, you can see, of 2.2. So we went from a 0.6 growth, you know, the number of times, that's a four times, you know, increase to get the 2.2. And then with the adjustments that we made this year, we're at a 4.7. So we finally got to a point where we're above that three. So I think it's a really, this is a really important slide because the MAP score is not just measuring algebra, algebraic thinking, it's also measuring geometry, measurement, um, and data, and also numbers and operations. So, um, and again, it's a, a nationally normed measure. So I think it's just a, it's a powerful data display. So, so then we wanted to dig in and say, okay, within that, um, who's learning within subgroups? You know, one of the things that we have, we have heard quite a bit about um, was our, our lowest, like our, our students that are struggling in math, that this isn't a good fit for them. They need math eight. And our students that are the highest achieving in math, this isn't a good fit because they need enriched an enriched algebra experience. And so what we did is we wanted to look at the growth based on the achievement. So we took our students based, and we sorted our students based on achievement. So we had the lowest achieving 25% to the left, then our medium low, 25% is the second one, medium high, and then highest achieving. So you can think of this as the students towards the left would likely be in math eight, and the students towards the right would likely be in enriched algebra. The blue bars are the 1920 growth scores. So the students actually, the blue bars, because they're 1920, that's the two, that's like the bifurcated model where we had the math eight and enriched algebra. You actually see the lowest achieving students regressed. Um, they didn't grow at all. It was a negative point, a negative 2.7 um, compared to this model where our, our students that achieved the, had the lowest achievement on the map score actually grew a 0.8. Um, you can see for the medium low, again, the red bar is this year, the blue bar is um, from the previous program in 1920, and you can see that go up. So the, our highest achieving students actually grew the most in this program. They had grown 3.9, so they had exceeded that national kind of norm, um, but in this new model, they grew at 7.6, which is just an incredible amount of growth um, for those top kids. And, and you know, the, the, what we don't have, um, from MAPS, we don't have a breakdown of what your bottom quartile should score. We can't necessarily say it should be a three. They only give us the three rip points as an average. Um, but we thought this was, again, more powerful data because when it comes to who is this program helping and who is it hurting, it shows us that it, it is significantly helping, based on these data, all of these different subgroups, um, regardless of achievement. And, you know, that's something we need to do some work on is how are we differentiating to support and enrich so we can get that point eight up higher but it certainly shows us a difference in the models and a more positive um, impact for the model that we have now. So we also broke the data down in the same way using race and ethnicity data. We also wanted to look across like total students, but also white, Hispanic, or Latino, black and African American, um, Asian, and multiracial. And it's the, the same layout of 1920 compared to 21-22. The 1920 is the blue bar. The 21-22 is the red bar, and in every single case, you can see there's a significant um, benefit to the algebra model that we're running now, the red bars. Um, and you can see the average growth um, across there. You can you know, draw an imaginary line there where the three would be, that's the national norm. And you can see that with this current model, um, pretty much every subgroup hits that number 
um, the blue bar only one does. All right, this is our, our final graphic within this kind of section. Is um, we did want to share eighth grade regions results from last year, um, and you can see how the students did. The, the gray bands. I don't want to be misleading. I want to point it out. Um, this this is based on New York State reporting and ESSER requirements. Um, they, it's kind of an interesting way they break out with what is considered a one, a two, a three, a four, and a five. So if you look, it's like zero to fifty-four, and then fifty-five to sixty-four. 65 to 79, 80 to 84, and I mention that because we're used to seeing um, like even jumps, and then when somebody doesn't have even jumps, it feels like it's disingenuous, and I, and I just wanted to point that out that it's not, that's actually how the state breaks it down, um, and you can see the number of students that scored, you know, a, a large number of students up in that 85 to 100, you can see um, how they, how they you know, trail off from there. So the overall, even despite the challenges of last year, the students did really well, and this June, we don't yet have the results, obviously, but we're looking forward to see how the students do in this new model. All right, so just in terms of adjustments, this is, we, we had seen this slide um, before. We're, we're thinking about 2020, you know, next year, 2022, 23, as we plan forward. Um, think about, um, you know, the adjustments. I'm not going to go through all of these. I know we've taken a lot of time, but these are the adjustments that we made this current year based on focus groups and, and surveys that we had sent to students and parents. Um, we have made these adjustments for year two, and we're thinking about um, year three. These are some of the things that we heard this year from a, a survey that we had sent out out in the fall. Um, increased the number of A, B, and C homework problems. Increased support from the STEAM teachers. Um, more professional learning opportunities for the faculty. Um, and more and earlier AIS support. We have been uh, hearing that um, it would be preferable if we could offer some opportunities during the school day for AIS. Um, recently, we had um, been asked by the Board of Education to provide some information with regard to how students are getting, getting support with regard to tutoring specifically. So we did send out a survey. Um, I had been asked to share the survey. It's after we did send out to all of the eighth grade parents a letter that had the survey questions in it. Um, but we basically asked um, students if they thought the course was too easy, just right, or too hard. Um, and we asked them which school they went to, Bell or Seven Bridges. Um, and then we asked them where they are getting their support from, if they're getting support at all. So this is this is the graph that shows the like level of challenge. You can see 57 students said the course is too hard, 77 students said it was too easy, and 180 are there in the middle that said it's. Um, just about right with regard to the level of challenge. But we also ask them, what kind of support do you access for algebra? So um, no support, you know, we got 119 students, um, extra help with my teacher was the next one down, um, math AIS, a family member, I have a private tutor, um, 92 students said they had a private tutor, um, and then a small number 16 said they have attend a math program outside of school, so we're thinking um, typical companies, I don't want to start li listing them, but many of us are familiar with them um, that provide extra math support. So this was the distribution. We thought this was interesting with the data. We cross-referenced um, how the students rated, if they said it was too difficult, just right, or too easy, and then we laid over that how many of those students within those groups have tutors. So you can see that 29 students sort of the left, the blue, is, um, has, has tutors. Um, you can see, obviously, the students that um, felt the course was too difficult, a um, large number of them did have tutors. You can see the middle bar there uh, where the challenge is just right, and then to the right, um, 10 students that thought it was too easy had a tutor. So, so this, I, I went back and forth as to whether or not we should put this in there, but I figured we'd give it a shot. So, so this one, uh, you know, I had heard that, um, that it's, you know, it's a challenge for us to figure out what's the impact of tutors on the success, you know, how, how are they impacting growth, just as an example, um, and because a significant number of students are tutored. So what we did was, for argument's sake, just like a hypothetical, we sorted our maps data and we gave tutors credit for all of the highest achieving kids, the kids that grew the most, um, we gave to the tutors. So we took out the 90 students or 91 students that grew the most and said, okay, we'll give those to the tutors, we'll say we had no impact on, on that significant growth stuff that all those students showed. So with the, for the students that were left, how did they do? Um, and I don't think it's even reasonable to say that students that are tutored are all like the top 90 in terms of the growth, but if we, we just did that as a hypothetical to see. And, and what we found was we still 
got a growth score of 1.67, so we still bested the, the previous model um, by a significant amount, so that our overall average score was 4.5 if you include all the students, regardless of their tutoring or not. Um, we don't have the specific information. We felt like we'd get better data from students if we made the survey anonymous, as opposed to having them put their name. Because once we, if we had their name and if they were tutored, then we'd be able to really like team tease in and figure out uh, more information. But we felt like we'd get more honest data from the students if they if they could do it anonymously. So, um, so this the, the you know even the tutoring impact, although it's undoubted that the tutors do have a positive impact. This just shows that um, the program is also, the faculty is also having a, a positive impact on these students in terms of growth, because it's still, even by removing those top 91 student growers, um, assuming they were the ones that were tutored, um, we still you know, more than doubled the average growth score. All right, so in terms of, of next steps, um, thinking about some adjustments for next year, we're going to add an integrated co-teaching model, some additional professional learning and curriculum development this summer. Um, we're working on redesigning some classrooms to support that collaborative work that Josh talked about, um, and additional math support. We're working hard with the master schedule to try to um, add some extra support for math um, during the school day. So we're working on those things. And then, you know, in terms of recommendations to the Board of Education, um, I just encourage you to you know, really consider this data as you make decisions moving forward, that we wait until we get those end of year map scores and regions results. I think that will tell us a lot um, that we continue to survey parents and students and run focus groups. We have been working, um, Jamie Edelman has been leading the work around MTSS, which is a multi-tiered system of supports. Um, so we're, we're going to work towards enhancing that system. Um, Build in additional opportunities for rigor to challenge students that feel like this course might be too easy. Further refine our curriculum, um, strategic staffing decisions, so we make sure our students have access to you know, really powerful teachers, um, and consider inviting students and faculty to speak to you all so you can hear directly from them um, with regard to the program. That's all we have. Okay. Um, thank you. That was a very thorough presentation and I feel like I have a lot more information now. Um, I do have a couple of questions. I'm going to start sort of so that everybody can ask so I have to break them down into two sort of overarching questions, one of which I think is probably more of an Adam question and one is probably more of Josh question. Um, so I'll just ask them both and then. So I guess one question that I, I've heard from a number of parents and that I guess I'm sort of grappling with is up until eighth grade, our kids go through our math sequence and they take first grade math and first grade and sixth grade math and sixth grade and seventh grade math and seventh grade. And then suddenly we're saying, but you're not supposed to take eighth grade math in eighth grade anymore, you're going to take algebra. And, and I know that you showed us the slide with all of the overlap, but I think it would be really helpful to understand the thinking around why sort of grade level math no longer seems like the appropriate option. And then the other question I have is really more, I guess, brass tacks of what's happening in the classroom in the sense of, you spoke a lot about the differentiation. And I guess I have sort of three questions that really go to how does this differentiation work, which is, if we're differentiating to such a substantial degree, wouldn't it on some level be easier on the teachers and the students to have the two class structure of the eighth grade math and the algebra? Um, and likewise, that if they're all working on different things, and yet we were expecting most of this class based on the slides to move on to one of those ninth grade geometry-based courses. If the work is so differentiated over the course of the class, are they all and how are they all prepared to, like are they all equally prepared then to move into that ninth grade class if they haven't essentially been doing all of the same work through the eighth grade algebra experience? And then I'm guessing also, with, and, 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 Sounds great, and we had some of this model for us with the working in groups and all that. But knowing that there are students who, and, and I find this somewhat relatable, really need math explained in like a step by step, more traditional, somebody lays it all out, how you have to do it, way, how does that still factor in to this more differentiated experience for the students who really need that like more structured approach? So I'm sorry, I know I just threw a lot out at once, but I guess those are sort of my overarching questions. 
Let's, let me start and then yeah. I can certainly jump in. So, so the first thing is um, in terms of the, like why not math 8 and why algebra, right? So what, what are we giving up in math 8? Um, we're giving up some math 8 statistics. There's still some statistics in algebra, but we're giving up some math 8 statistics and we're giving up a geometry unit in math 8. Um, I, I don't have any concerns that the students are not going to get enough geometry once they get to geometry, for example. And I don't think it's um, a, a big miss to not have that geometry section. So for, for me, to build a really strong foundation and double down in algebra, hold the geometry, doesn't seem to be a big sacrifice. I haven't heard anybody really say, like, we really missed the geometry part of eighth grade. The statistics, there is a small statistics unit already in algebra, and it's not a heavy lift to be able to do that statistics. And to build a really strong foundation in algebra, I think is setting students up for success, in addition to giving them opportunities to take five years of high school math. So that, that's what I'd say first. Second, I'd say with regard to differentiation, it is absolutely easier on a teacher to have lots of tracks, of, of course. It absolutely is to have homogeneous groups. The tracking research is really interesting and complicated. And the tracking research shows that it hurts a lot of kids, um, especially subgroups that are predictable, subgroups that would negatively be affected by tracks, by being put into tracks that are not the highest track. So when it comes to like access to rigor and access to, and, and the messages that we send and losing the opportunity to hear questions from students that might be really interested in math um, and expectations of the teacher all impact that performance of that low ability track group. So when it comes to like, is it easier to teach homogeneous groups of kids? Absolutely it is. Um, does that have a really negative impact, on, a really negative impact on groups of kids that are put in tracks that are not the highest track? Often it does, and the research is kind of mixed. You can find research on tracking that goes either way, um, but within a high resource community like ours, when it comes to students that are performing at this level, um, there's a you know a little bit of a, a trade-off there with regard to flexibility as they get and move into high school. Um, but yeah, so and, and I want to add a, a few pieces to the idea of having students in one class through an algebraic experience. Um, having them in there allows students to move through different experiences. A student might struggle with linear equations, but fly through. Um, and if they were in a two-tiered system, they would be in that math A tier, and they would not have the, experience, the quadratic experience that they might excel in. Um, and a teacher is allowed to now make those decisions about what students need support in which units of algebra. Um, so they are able to structure their lessons so that they can target students. Um, students, when we see students who are struggling, um, lots of times, especially in a track program, they're struggling because they're not, there's not access to the curriculum for them to, to learn and excel in, um, especially in middle school. We see that mindset is one of the largest pieces, and math anxiety is one of the largest pieces that prevents students from learning. Um, and by having them in a class where they feel like there's lots and lots and lots of different options, it starts to build that growth mindset. Um, so, so that is one piece of having students in a, in a class. Um, the other piece is instructional model, right? You mentioned having things broken down and structured is something that's very important. Um, our teachers do that. Our anchor charts look a lot like stepwise methods for certain things. Um, but it also allows students to develop the mindsets on their own um, and develop the curriculum on their own. And then let them make the structures and the systems to say, okay, I have this. This is now goes in the back of my notebook. I can refer back to this for the test, the next unit, whatever, whatever that piece may, may be. And a teacher, our, our teachers are incredible. They can absolutely geotarget the type of instruction that they know a student needs to succeed in a mathematics course. Um, and we've done a lot of work with our faculty around multiple modes of instruction in their classroom um, that allows students, again, to be engaged from beginning to end, but also be able to synthesize their learning to take it into the next piece. So, sort of thinking back on Hillary, um, you're saying that tracking is, is not so good. In high school, we have tracking, right? In high school, it's just the Middle school or eighth grade, now we're tracking it. You know, foundations, I can't remember what math is. Math 9, math 9, uh, accelerated, or math 9 honors, you know, depending on which geometry. 
So we, we, we've gone from a non-track eighth grade algebra to a track system afterwards. So that's the first biggest question I'm trying to understand. Um, I, I, we've always been very successful in the historic results. But I think, I, I don't know the answer is going to be as you look it up. It seems that the kids who are taking that nine algebra regions took it at different levels. Some took it in eighth grade, some took it in ninth grade, some took it in tenth grade when they're prepared for it. So it seems if we have students who are in uh, eighth grade algebra now and they are having anxiety and we're sort of setting them up failing with making them more anxious, right? They can't catch on to it as quickly. And I understand what you're saying, Josh, where you have, I mean, my math skills are somewhat okay, but certain concepts I learned better than others. Um, the other very interesting statistic up there was it's like a third of our students have tutors, almost a third, and that's great if parents can afford a tutor, but what about just can't, can't do a tutor? So I think they're, and I know that uh, I had some tutors calling me, but they're, they're maxed out. They can't even think of their students. So I'm not sure if that's just for math eight or for the whole you know, cohort of children in math. Um, let's see, maybe we can do that while I need to remember something else. Yeah, if I could, let me start with high school tracks. I think it's a, it's a very different model in the high school when a student gets to build a schedule that has a variety of areas that they could potentially explore. It gets really challenging to start to compare, for students to start to compare each other. Right? One of them might take drama, one of them might take a visual art course, one of them might take an engineering course or a STEAM course. They're interested in different things. So they, they balance their schedule so they're in some more challenging courses. So I'm going to take an AP year as they get older and not an AP year. And, and they start to almost sub-specialize in the departments. But that's a very different thing than taking a grade level and say you're going to be all in the same courses for everything except half of you are going to go here. The, the, for math because you're able and the other half is not going to go there, you're going to go here. And, and I think that sends a really different message to do that in 7th grade going into 8th grade than it does for ninth graders that have a lot of other options and they sort and resort and not tie together on teams um, as closely and they, it's much harder to compare those schedules because although you might be in a more advanced math track, I might be taking an engineering course and you're taking an art course and you know, so, so there's, there's a lot of areas for students can, to, to explore and thrive and, and show that they're really strong in other areas. So tracking for me in high school feels very different than tracking in middle school. Yeah, and, and, and the other piece I'd like to have about tracking in middle school is about early tracking. Um, middle school students um, developmentally at the end of seventh grade and the end of eighth grade are in very different places than they are at the beginning of ninth grade. Um, so by delaying that a year um, helps students to mature both mathematically, um, socially, and academically. Um, and also get some study skills in place, then they can start to use tracking in their high school program. Um, and a lot of the research starts to show that um, if you can have tracking in high school and, and prevent the middle school model from having that, students tend to be more successful um, by the end of their high school career. Do you know what the success rate of students who might have gone to a math honors or a degree in it, have they been able to keep that level going up? Or have they been able to you know what, it would be really helpful if we could answer the board's questions, and we definitely will have all the time we need for public comment. Um, but I think right now, for us to be able to interact in the board in a way that feels comfortable, I would just appreciate it if people could wait for a public comment period to share your thinking with us. Um, so, Josh, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, so I don't have the data of I'm not, I'm not, the... You don't have the data, just think, when we look at that data, though. Yeah. We can, we can take a look and track students of um, what courses they were taking in ninth grade and where they wound up, whether in the end of ninth grade or under ninth grade. Just, just to see, you know, yeah. I'm, like, like Hillary, I'm hearing from, from parents, I'm hearing from the community, from people who don't have children in school, that they're concerned about this. So I think, um, thank you very much. This has been a very comprehensive presentation at Adam and Junction, but you can tell that there's 
was concerned. I would also like to share, and I think it's important for us to find that as well. So we found out the, the tutoring um, report from our students in algebra, and I'm, I'm curious to see how that would be reflected in other courses that we have um, throughout the district, because there's been a history of this theme that um, there's a lot of tutoring that takes place both in the high school and at the elementary level. So I'm not saying that tutoring in this course is higher the <coughs> courses that we offer, but I think that's a piece of information we should really look at before we start to make an assumption that this is different than any other course that we have um, that our students take here and the amount of support that our parents feel our kids need. Um, I, think so I, just that. I think that's a good, that's a good point, Lauren. Um, I have plenty more questions, but I'll pass it on. So. Okay. Okay, I have a lot of questions. And you have the microphone, so. I had a new question as I was listening to the presentation, but I want to somehow organize it in a way that makes sense. And some questions might not be answered right away, and that's okay, because I don't want you to answer difficult questions quickly. Um, I guess, there's a lot going on in my head because one, I'm an educator, two, I also have an eighth grade, um, three, and I have two more kids coming up to this, and each child learns differently, functions differently, and feels differently about that. And um, I know when you first, when you talked to Josh, when you talked about um, how students have anxiety around that. Um, I can relate to that. Um, I'll just give an example about math anxiety. And, and you did say being in a class with lots of different options lessens the anxiety. And yes, that's one perspective. But I'm going to give an example of when we had that board activity here, when we were doing the math activities with the wakeboards, and we were grouped out into different groups. I immediately had my math anxiety um, because of my own childhood trauma around math. And so although it made me less anxious that I was going to be working in a group and not singled out working alone independently, um, but at the same time, the trauma from years back grade school, fourth grade to be exact, um, came back. And it made me feel better working in a group with being around other people, but also made me self-conscious because I felt like maybe I should be contributing more or maybe if somebody thought that I was good at math for whatever reason and I could, couldn't contribute it as much as I wanted to or maybe I just needed a little bit more time than the time that was allotted for that activity. So these are just different perspectives. I'm not saying that one is that is, is the more right perspective than the other, but I just want all of us to be thinking about these things because I try really hard when I sit here to not only think of the perspective of my own experience in my family with my children, or my experience as an educator because I have XYZ background, or even my group of friends that I talk to regularly. I want to be able to think and listen outside of that because there's more. There's more than just what I know or what I've heard or what I experience. Um, so that's an example. And then I know we talked about tracking. So when we say tracking, and early tracking, what does early tracking mean? When does when is that exactly? Right? So I'm not sure. Are you talking about grade school? And are you talking about middle school? But in middle school, here we could define it as fifth grade through eighth grade. But is that really are we talking about that? Um, and I know we're talking specifically towards algebra, math here, but then is all tracking bad, 
right? Because we have to track somehow, and there is tracking, right? And I know you're not saying that tracking is bad, but you know, and there's evidence. But I, I want to be able to understand that, if, you know. Um, and then we look at the level of rigor. So we want everybody wants rigor, um, but are we achieving that with everybody? And um, what does that look like? And if we are um, wanting to give access to rigor and wanting to give access to five years of math uh, and wanting to have a strong algebra curriculum because we know that this is good, maybe the question isn't even about do we want algebra or not or do we love algebra or not or do we support the fact that algebraic thinking is important because I think maybe the answer to all of that is yes, but maybe it's just about families having an opportunity to choose, right? Um, I look at this um, slide, I don't know what slide this is, um, slide 107, and when we think about student support, and tutoring survey, we have 119 kids that say they got no support. And immediately, I have no choice but to think just right away about my family situation. We don't have a paid tutor, but does that mean that he's not, my child is not getting support? So does that, when you say no support, these 119, is that no support, no pay support, right? Because I'm not helping with the math homework every night because I refuse to, but my husband is do, doing math support. Maybe not every night, but enough math nights for if I were to go to my child and say, what did you put there? I, you know, I didn't ask him, but he should have put he gets support. Um, but then one might say, with the data coming in in terms of being successful in math, why is this even a problem if your child is doing well? And I don't know if we can measure that in that way. Um, because I think growth, we have all these charts on you know growth and numbers, which is great, but at the same time, another layer would be growth also is on a personal level, right? And we expect our students to grow, even if it's very, very small growth. Um, and we should see growth on all levels, um, because this math learning experience, like any other learning experience in this district, is a continuum, right? And you guys said this over and over again, it, we're building on top of everything. Um, do I think algebra, eighth grade algebra, is harder than eighth grade math? Maybe it's not, but maybe it's just the name. Maybe it's just the idea of it, right? But that's still cause for not feeling successful or not feeling confident, right? And that's still a reason. Um, you know, if we say 91 of the top students and we, let's say we just, we didn't have an impact on them, but they were tutored and that's why they were the highest achieving students. We can also say, or maybe they were the kids that would have tested in to enrich algebra if we were in the older um, model. Um, I do think it's really important to look at these focus groups and parents and which parents are we talking to who are we leaving out? Who, even though we try so hard, we will never reach because of whatever the reasons are? Which students are we talking to? And even the survey that was conducted the past two days, they could say, I, I'm, doing, I'm feeling great about this now, or I'm not feeling great, but we also don't have a way of knowing, is this a strong math student, or is this not a strong math student? You know, I might be a strong math student, but 
I'm feeling great or I'm not feeling great. Or it, it changes what we're looking at in the survey because we don't have we don't have that data point. Um, the level of assignments. We look at the level of assignments and we're tracking, right? Because in the end, ultimately, it's my eighth grade student is going to be recommended for something next year. It's a recommendation. A parent could come in and say, well, I disagree. I think even though you recommend this, these are the reasons why I think that this could happen. So these are all things, all the safety nets, enrichment pieces, extra help, AIS. These are all things that I appreciate as a parent, as an educator. Um, but I think we need to continuously, and I think you are because you prepared this extensive presentation and you're going to be hearing from the community. But I, I want to encourage all of you, not just the administration, but everybody, including myself, to when we sit down at the table to have a discussion about something, whether it's math, whether it's theater, whether it's lunch, that we come with an open heart and an open mind. And while we're listening in that active way, that we don't, we put our assumptions to the side and just listen and then think about, okay, so I heard this and not just say, okay, no, this, no, this is wrong. I, I just want this done. Or no, I want to just do this. Or I really encourage everybody, and I'm, I'm saying this to myself out loud, to think about the different ways that families are experiencing this particular topic and that it's not is it a, is it the school district against this is it the board that's going to back me up or it's, it's it's not about that if we're here if you collected all this to say look look we want we want these for our students for all students then I think everyone needs to say, okay, so what are we going to do next? And that, and, and, and I think it takes time. I'm not saying that it should take three more years, but that's why I'm not really asking a specific question. I, 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 I think I just wanted to make those statements and just say my thoughts out loud. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Um, I I have a couple of comments and questions about this too. And first of all, thank you for the extremely thorough report. Um, I, I think it's I really appreciate it actually the historical perspective because um, I want to listen to what the current parents are feeling and and I think it's really important to hear what their kids are experiencing. But I think as as a parent of three children who are out of the school system and all went through eighth grade math, it, it, it's startling to me to see the change over the past couple of years in terms of starting out where I know so many students were sort of clamoring to get into algebra, but they were shut out of it. Um, and it was a tracking based on, you know, certain criteria and there was no parent choice. So when Dr. Ackerman opened it up, to parent choice, we saw those numbers shift. That was very interesting for me to see because I could feel that, that there were kids, and there were kids who doubled up in high school because it's like they, they felt like they were mistracked and should have been in advanced math and really sort of got their math legs a little later on and doubled up and went on to sort of achieve um, great things in math in high school. So I saw that shift to 60-40, which was interesting. So, um, 
it's interesting to me that we went from people wanting to get into that the rich class to people being concerned that it was too much for their students in a short period of time. And I know that a lot happened because of COVID and how we had to cohort them and all of that. So the thing is, I think the most important thing we need to vote, we're trying to balance two things, fit and opportunity. And I think for me, one, I, Two sort of related questions. One, is when we talk about tracking, and I have a similar thought about the differentiation. If we're differentiating so much in the classroom, wouldn't it be easier to track? But to me, tracking also, if there's if there's choice, it doesn't have the same stigma or problematic aspects of tracking when there's no choice. That you're making a judgment on a seventh grade student that may not be accurate but you're not giving them an opt-out or opt-in opportunity. So when Dr. Ackerman did that, that seemed to me, in my mind, a very workable system um, so that, that a student could do that. But I noticed here that it used to be, I think, you, you enriched algebra when you took that class. So there was an enriched algebra that just says there's geometry and enriched geometry. But right now under this model, there doesn't seem to be algebra and enriched algebra. Is that correct? Right, so I guess what I'm wondering, it seems from what you're saying, there are a lot of algebraic principles in eighth grade math. And a lot of students really could handle those algebraic principles. So has there been, is there, is there a place or possibility for a place for algebra and enriched in eighth grade that we're just basically calling it something different? Like we may have in our minds that eighth grade math, math eight, is different than algebra, but math A, and I'm not a curriculum person, may have a lot of algebra, but we can call it algebra. I think that's a good question, Jay, and that's something that we've been talking about, but we really feel like we need the end of the year scores from maps and the regions of scores to help make a recommendation to you that's fully informed. Right. And so, you know, part of our conversations around potentially having and running that model next year as a pilot would be the data that Adam and Josh has shared that students in enriched algebra weren't growing at the same rate as students who would have been placed in enriched algebra this year in our classes currently. Right. So I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that might not be the suggestion out of this process, but right. it's a definitely a data point that we really have to think about because are we limiting the growth of students in enriched algebra next year if we change the model based on what we know from our experience this year compared to our pre-pandemic growth? Right. using maps. So uh, listen, these are all really important conversations, but we feel like we need all of the information. Right, oh, I absolutely agree. And I, I, I really agree, I, I appreciate seeing the growth factor, and that, that leads to my other point. And again, some of this is, is anecdotal, but uh, even when I had kids in high school, uh, I would hear, I know that maybe there aren't neighboring communities here that are compensatory school districts that are doing algebra for everyone in ninth grade. But that's going on in a lot of places across the country, from, from my understanding. And I'm wondering if we can get data on that, because as I know I've said to some of the, the other board members when we were, you know, uh, that, that I have been surprised over the years that I would hear from colleagues, you know, colleagues, friends, relations, you know, family relations in other areas that were lower performing school districts that algebra in eighth grade was given. And I was always surprised that it was different in New York. So for me, like a really good data point would be to see like what's going on across the country. Is it really, and I see that growth, how the kids are growing with algebra. Is that really a norm that New York State hasn't taken on yet? I don't know that. Um, but, but again, it goes back to Fit. Maybe maybe the algebra they should all be taking algebra in eighth grade, but the curriculum has to be manageable and it has to be somehow differentiated because I don't want our kids to have math anxiety. I don't want them struggling, um, and I also want the ones who are really have a knack for math to be able to achieve. Um, and just my last point, which I'll say, which is to the tutoring, um, as as one of the parents up here who's been in this district a long time, I would love to see the tutoring in other subjects because that's been going on for so, so long. Um, and even when you know there was tracking and there was differentiating math, there were many parents that would 
have their kids tutored so they could be in that advanced math. Uh, and, and I think that's been going on forever, but it goes on a lot of subjects, and there may be parents that are having their children consistently tutored for every subject, or ones that are calling in when they have a unit that they don't understand, or, or, or other types of help. So I would be curious. Um, I think it's, impo it's very important for this discussion, but it's, it's a bigger picture that there may be students getting tutored in biology just as much as they're getting tutored in algebra. So um, I just want to make sure that we're making accurate comparisons here, you know, in terms of the actual percentages. And, and, but at, at the end of the day, I appreciate all the work and I appreciate all the data. I, I really, really want to see our kids succeed. I want to see them comfortable in their classroom. And I know we're differentiating it now. That, that may be the model. We may need to differentiate it more so everybody's comfortable. But I appreciate all the work that's being done so that we can support all of our students in the best way possible. So thank you. Can I ask just one follow-up question on, on one of the data points that Jane mentioned? When we're looking at the growth, and obviously the growth is great amongst our current eighth grade students to the question of the possibility of doing an enriched algebra and algebra A. I guess my question is when we look at the growth of that of the current cohort of eighth graders versus the, the previous cohort, there have obviously you talked a lot about sort of the curricular changes and the teaching changes that we've done. Is the previous math score of that higher achieving quadrant, or whatever you want to call work, under sort of this new teaching model, or is that under the old teaching? But like, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, are these students in this cohort that are achieving at this higher growth rate, is, that, is there any way to know whether it's because they're in a math, a combined algebra class, or because we've made changes around the way we're teaching algebra? You know what I mean? Does my question make sense? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it, it, it's a great question. I mean, I think all of you have brought up really good points of things that Adam and I have been thinking about and asking questions about and trying to, to dive deeply into. And um, I think, we could try and look at what data points we could look at that might answer that question. Um, the the maps data doesn't answer that question. Um, it just gives us where the students are, how they group. Um, but I, as you're asking that, I am wondering what type of information we could find out which might help us answer is it an instructional model, is it a class model, um, or is it a student model? Right? So, can I add one more thing too, which I, I know this is so tough, and this is in every every school and every university that so um, so many times your experience in a classroom is, is based on the instruction going on in that particular classroom. And so when we have a subject like this that you know we're, we're trying out a new methodology, we're trying out a new curriculum, um, I think it's really important for professional development purposes um, that we are trying to level that field so that every kid, all teachers are different, and I understand that, but I think we have to be really conscious of who's teaching those classes now as we go through these curriculum changes to make sure that our kids are having, you know, aligned experiences and, and that the, the teachers can help that out. We agree. So I just, before, um, I just want to thank Adam and Josh for organizing and presenting to you all this information tonight. And I just, I just want to acknowledge this is a really challenging decision for the district. I mean, Adam and um, Josh have shared some really compelling data that supports the model that we have in place, but I understand there's community concerns about the reality of how that's impacting some of our homes that need to be taken into consideration. And um, that's why I believe that this is going to take more time and more thought and a complete analysis of the entire program over the course of the year before we land on what next year's going to look like. Uh, but I do, I do want parents to know, and whoever's speaking tonight, we're certainly going to listen to you, um, and we'll factor that into our conversations around how to move forward. But I also want to um, underscore, underscore the importance of the data that we shared with you tonight. And all this will be available on our website because I know we went through this rather quickly. Um, but we've, uh, Adam and Josh have crafted a page of all of our communications and everything that we've done since we began this process. 
uh, that we'll be sending out uh, through our newsletter that our community can access so they can look through some of our documentation as, as well. And then I'd also probably like to say, beyond the public comment tonight, because it's not a Q&A, anyone is welcome to contact us and we welcome those conversations where we could have that Q&A discussion uh, with you directly regarding your experiences. So, uh, so thank you. And thank you everyone for your attention and patience tonight. We're a little later than we normally are, but we thought it would be important for us to have this conversation. I really so, thank Josh and Anna for an incredible amount of work and, and detailed work to, to really, and it, it shows you real concern for, for you know, responding to the community, for trying to give our students the best curriculum, and it was very, very much appreciated. Yes, and I know, you know, we have been saying for you know a couple months now because we've been getting questions about the eighth grade math program we want to hear what's going on and we want to see the data and thank you because you gave us a lot of data and that's really helpful because we need that we can't we can't make decisions any of us without knowing what's happening and part of that is is hearing you know what's going on in the classrooms part of that you know we're going to hear from parents and we have heard from parents and it, it's collectively you know it's a lot of information and it's a lot of information that we need to take and, and look at and think about um but as dr ackman said you know we're not making any decisions tonight but we're not going to delay this until a point where it's like well we can't do anything about it now i don't want anybody to be worried that that's the plan to like delay until it's not a change that can be made that's not anybody's intent we're trying to go through this process and evaluation thoughtfully and with as much information as possible to truly make the best decision for all of our students and families. Um, okay, so I guess the last thing I was saying in the superintendent's report, I just want to acknowledge is Teacher Appreciation Week and the PTA has been supporting our uh, faculty uh, at the start of this week and throughout the week and uh, we just, uh, I want to just acknowledge that this is a, a time for us to recognize our faculty and the work that they do every day for the students in this district. So um, not only our algebra teachers, but all the teachers in this district, I just want to thank them. And uh, we've sent our, our stuff out um, on behalf of the, of, the, of the central office, but I do want to take a moment to publicly thank them at the end of the, the superintendent's report. So thank you. Thank you. Um, that brings us to committee reports. I have nothing to report. That was quick. <laughs> okay. Um, that brings us to the public comment period. We welcome public comments, and in respect for each other's time, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Board members may be contacted via email or phone. After the public comment has been completed, board members may have a discussion amongst themselves regarding comments presented. And I just want to reiterate that this is not a Q&A, and of course, if you reach out to us, we are always happy to talk to anybody at any time. So please come up and state your name. Um, and Oh, sure. So, okay, so if you go over three minutes, we are able to extend your time, but we have to formally do it. It's a process. By one minute. By one minute. We can do that. Just give everybody a heads up. Um, so, come on down to the microphone and please tell us who you are before you speak. Hi, I'm Brooke Stewart. Um, I have three kids in the district one in ninth grade, my daughter Avery is in seventh, and uh, a son in fourth. Um, I'm so close to you. Oh, sorry. My oldest went through this program through COVID. Um, he definitely should have been in eighth grade math, uh, went through the algebra program, struggled pretty, pretty hard during it, was tutored around the clock, um, you know, got an 83 average in the class, which we thought was pretty good. Um, he failed the regents, completely failed. The data, by the way, that you have about the regents, you don't add any of the data of how many kids that year did not take the regents. Um, he's now in geometry, which is exactly where he should be tracked to. Another data point that I would ask the board to look at is how many kids in ninth grade have started in a course and then went down this year. It's significant. If you look at the honors course or if you look at the enriched geometry course, all, there is a significant amount of kids that have gone down because they were not prepared. The other thing to add is that really this year added a new course that's called Algebra 1 Review slash Algebra 2. 
So my son was given that as an option because they felt his algebra skills were not strong enough to continue into Algebra 2 next year. If we're making those accommodations in ninth grade, the, this program is not working. It's not working for the children who are above average, who were bored to tears in ninth grade. It's not working for my child who will speak, who struggles through seventh grade math. I, it, it's, it's just not working. All I want is a choice of a parent. I think Kaylee said it perfectly. There's kids that should be in this program and will take your calculus and your, all these APs, and they should. But I want a choice as a parent for where my child should be. My child has struggled in this school district for years. Um, she has learning disabilities, and we support her as much as we can. And as a parent, I've already said to her, we don't care what you get in math next year. I, she can get D's for all I care. But as a student, as a, as a 13, 14 year old girl, to get D's or F's in math is really, like, it, it's just for the, the self-esteem. And in ninth grade, which is sad, you will track her and you will put her in a class that she will get success out of. But I think you're, you have all this data tonight, and that's great, and I love data, but you're not looking at any of the emotional components of these kids. These kids are falling apart. It's, it's, it's really upsetting. I mean, I saw my son who's an average math student. He, he got through by the skin of his teeth. You can put data up there. It's awesome that all these kids are doing well, but you're not looking at the emotional factors that go into these kids. So my daughter will speak you know, about her personal experience. I'm begging you, please just give each parent a choice of what they want to do for their kid. Let the kids who want to excel in this awesome math program do that, and let me as a parent make a choice for my daughter for her to feel you know, strong about her math program next year. Thank you. Hi, I'm Avery Stewart. I'm in seventh grade, and I'm better than In third grade, I got an IEP and was diagnosed with dyslexia and ADHD. I'm here tonight to say that we should have an option to take um, what math class, uh, an option of what math class to take. I go to a tutor once a week already just to get a C. I get modified tests and homework and I worked really hard in seventh grade, and that's very challenging for me. Going to an advanced math class next year caused me a lot of anxiety knowing that, I'll, knowing that I will not be successful because it's not at my level. So if I'm in a math class with people who understand math very well and are getting 100 on tests, and I'm struggling to keep up at 20, it's very upsetting to me, and there's clearly a way to fix this for students like me to have a to go back to when they had a choice of two math weight, of two math classes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Evelyn Blastrom. I have a son, seventh grade and eighth grade. Um, I I wanted to address the. Um, what uh, Dr. Ackerman said at the beginning, all opening remarks about regarding button hook, that there are no documented um, archaeological uh, significant findings there. Um, I wanted to just uh, say that um, uh, since 2019, there have been um, some stones that have been verified by Native American people um, from two tribes that have in fact reached out by letters written and emails to offer their findings, their interpretations, their um, way of authentic authenticating the stone structures that um, represent different things on, on the site, part of their, their, their culture. And, and um, so I, I just wanted to ask whether you would um, uh, give credence at least to investigate, to find out, to respond also to the Narragansett tribe, as well as the um, 
the Ramapo Lenape tribe uh, people who have reached out for um, a request to meet to describe what um, what they have found and what they see. And I'm sure they've photographed from uh, a neighboring property, which is up close to the school's property. The stones continue um, from one property to the other. Um, and just to just to conclude that um, as educators, leaders for young citizens um, going into a, a diverse, increasingly diverse and interconnected world, um, and and we say to them that. Uh, Empathy and, and these um, matter. That the um, the steps. I just want to say erasure and interrupting the pattern. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Diane Pufel, and I've had the opportunity to speak with you before about the math issue. Um, I know Avery left, but I really would like to commend her. Um, it's hard not to be emotional, but these are children. These are children who have suffered socially and emotionally through COVID, and they are really trying their very best. Why can't we accept that they are individuals with different learning styles, with different preferences, and they shouldn't have to have the same goal you might have, Adam, or you might have, Josh, with regard to math and achieving such a high level of math achievement. We accept as parents who our children are, and it's really upsetting to think that our district doesn't. You talked about high school as when ninth grade tracking starts, but let's talk about the Learning Center at Bell and where our children who need the extra math support are pulled out of a Spanish class and they are denied a language, and it is embarrassing. Those children have to leave a language when all their children are walking into one because it is the only time at Bell that our children are given the support they so desperately need. These are children that are struggling with basic concepts. You talk about the three-level tiered homework assignment, my son cannot even graphically organize where to put an answer on your well-categorized, strategically organized sheet. This is not meeting students' needs. And when I talked to the teacher, I was told this shouldn't be hard as this was an easy topic. To be told that my son who could not answer a question was being given something easy so clearly defines what our district interprets as where our children should be. I ask you to not think of our children as the data you pointed out on the graph, but to think of them as the individuals they are. And they deserve an appropriate education, and they do not need to be tutored, stressed, and put under this pressure that you are putting them through unnecessarily. You talk about the mindset and how it prevents students from learning. I'm sorry, your child sits at a table and is bouncing from one area to the other with ADHD because they cannot stay on task to complete a math problem, you have so greatly impacted their mindset. You have turned a child off from math. And to think that child is going to go to really and suddenly become a math student is not really responsible or realistic. And those children have greatly compromised who they are as learners. Not all of our children need high-level math courses to be successful in life. I appreciate this has worked for both of you. I ask you to kindly consider our districts as a large, a more global issue. We as parents have the right to opt out of certain things that are not appropriate. This is a high school level course. So when my, yes, I understand, I'll finish. I have two. Oh, sorry. Can I just say one thing? That I have two other children that went through this curriculum. Spend your time. Just give me one second. Okay.
can I have a motion to extend the speaker's time by one minute? Okay. All in favor? You have an additional minute. Thank you. I will make it quick. I just want to say that I'm a teacher. I have my special education background, my regular education background. I've been in the classroom for over 20 years. I have three children in this district, two of which are at the high school, one of which who takes very high-level math courses. He is a math student. I accept my children are different. I ask you to please accept the same of all of our children in the district. Allow parents to opt out of a class and to have choices. Thank you. Daniel Rosenberg. Um, first, I've spoken to both Josh and Adam over the last, you know, 18 months as I have a freshman uh, at Greeley right now, and you all have been incredibly helpful plotting Jenna's course. Um, I have a student who falls on the other side of the spectrum, and I also have three different children who are very different in that I expect to fall into different math programs. By having just one course last year, there was a significant impact into where she fell this year in ninth grade, and more importantly, the preparedness for Math 9 honors. Um, we've spoken about simple tactical things that can be done. For instance, going to Math 9 honors, there was no summer packet. There weren't even topics given. For cornerstones, for example, there were topics that the children could review on their own to try and level the playing field when everyone walked in on day one. That wasn't done for Math 9 Honors. So you had children who really enjoyed math, did it outside of school, and or had been tutored, walking in with children who had just gone through the same basic course um, for algebra, algebra, uh, eighth grade algebra, and there was a significant difference. And so um, I know Brock Stewart asked the same question, but I think one key data point to look at is the number of children who dropped down this year from Math 9 Honors compared to previous years of Math 9 Honors. Um, you have a significant number of students who are bored in enriched geometry but couldn't cut Math 9 Honors at the very beginning because they weren't given those topics that they normally would have got in eighth grade math in the enriched course. And please understand, this is not to diminish any of um, the children who actually need the other side of the help, right, who are not strong math students. Um, but there is also the other side of the spectrum as well. And I think by just having one math course, we're actually hurting the majority, not the majority, we're hurting both ends of the spectrum. Um, and from a data perspective, uh, as someone who has, who, who knows how to manipulate data and models, one of the things that really piqued my interest was everything, all of the data was just, in my opinion, one-sided. And I appreciate what you were trying to show with growth and everything like that. But where I looked at where the growth was starting from, it was a lower starting point. Um, and so I appreciate that the red increased from 0.6, I think it was 2.7, 4.4, whatever that delta was. But we were also starting off with, may I just have an extension? I have a motion to extend the speaker's time by one minute. All in favor? You have an extra minute. Thank you. Um, I, I, I just wonder if there was other data that might have shown different aspects of it. Because whenever I see data that is just biased one way, or, or pointing in one way, my brain starts asking questions about what am I not seeing up there. Um, but again, I just want to say thank you for the report. Thank you for helping me on my personal case so I can actually track where my daughter should be moving forward, and I know this isn't an easy subject, but it does impact not only, it, Jenna's already passed, but it will also impact my other two, and so thank you. Hi, Jocelyn Herman again. 
Um, so I had one child who went through the Enriched Algebra program as it used to be. Um, I have a current eighth grader now, both of my who would have been in the Enriched, I believe. Um, and I have an upcoming child who is not my math child, who probably does not belong in the Enriched. I don't know, she's only in third grade, but that's who it, she seems to be. I also do not believe that there should be one math program. I think if you want to have algebra for every eighth grader because you want to give them five years of high school math, there is no reason why you can't have, as Jane said, an algebra class and an enriched algebra class. All kids are not the same type of math student, and that's okay. Just like all kids are not as creative, all kids are not musical. That doesn't make them bad kids that feel bad about themselves. Not everyone is a math child, and some kids are math children. And my current eighth grader, and I've spoken to Josh about this, has been bored this entire year. Again, like Dana said, no disrespect for the kids who are struggling. On the other end of the spectrum, my child is bored. He is completely and totally, utterly bored. And the enrichment that was given, the C-level problems, is one problem that's never reviewed in class because a class discussion on the C-level problem wouldn't apply to the whole class. They're given an answer key, and they get to check, oh, I got it right, great. To me, that is not enrichment by any stretch of the imagination. I don't know that he's gonna be prepared the way my daughter was for either enriched or honors next year in the high school. You know, he doesn't have homework because everything gets done in class so quickly because they're bored. And he, as a result, has a, he might be a math student, but he's developed no study habits. And I blame the school for that. And part of that is COVID, because we had a very tough year last year and the kids are playing catch up. But he has no study habits because it's been too easy. And so my 11th grader, who went through enriched algebra, came out of eighth grade, I felt, ready for Greeley. She worked hard, she was challenged appropriately, and she succeeded and went on and has succeeded in math like Greeley at a high level. But she developed math study habits and science study habits and all forms of study habits in that. And I do not believe, while my son is just as good a student as her and capable, probably, of what she's capable of, he's developed no study habits because he hasn't had to study. Because it's been too easy, especially in math where I expected to see the challenge. And to Dana's point on the data, I question the data too because I wonder if coming off of last year's COVID, they started at a, at a lower point. Can I have one can I have one more minute? Can I have a motion to consent to your Sunday minute? A second? All in favor? So I question if the data is starting from a lower point and thus allowing higher growth from the get-go. I also question if the math is geared more towards the eighth grade math curriculum. So while they had more eighth grade math than algebra this year than normally would be in English algebra, that is going into the math testing as well. Thank you. My name is Trisha Murray. I have two children in the district, a fourth grader and a sixth grader. We're not at uh, eighth grade level yet, but we will be soon. Uh, I want to thank you for the presentation, laying out all of the information and data that you have in the course. I am, however, still trying to understand the greater need for this decision and the reasoning behind it. Um, if the goal is to give all students access to calculus, there are other ways to go about doing that in the high school sequence. This is not the only answer to that to solve that problem. Um, I'm very concerned that the necessary supports for students to be successful in eighth grade are not in place. And I'm not just referring to the supports in eighth grade. I know you present a lot of things you want to do at the eighth grade level. I mean all the way starting from the youngest levels, from early elementary. To my knowledge, there are no math intervention specialists in the district. There's no math, may I ask, at the elementary level during the school day. Before or after school does not meet students' needs. It just doesn't. Um, my daughter, who's in middle school, can't take advantage of math AIS and it's after school on a day where CCB is also scheduled. Um, so it's pretty ineffective. Um, so not having the appropriate supports in place for kindergarten through eighth grade and putting students in a high school level course 
It ends in a regents exam, but the grade that goes in my high school transcript is very problematic. And what's going to happen is the students will not pass algebra, they'll have to retake it in ninth grade, and it's really damaging to self-esteem and confidence. And as I heard in the, tonight that you mentioned SEL at least two or three times, I know you're probably aware there's a mental health crisis. Um, it's, it's really impacting adolescents, especially uh, in Chappaqua as well, and we need to be supporting them as much as possible right now and making sure that we reduce the pressure and stress and, sh and, and support them any way that we can. So I'm really hoping that the board and the administrators recognize the importance of giving our children the time and space they need to build a strong foundation so they can really thrive socially, emotionally, and academically. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marie Short. Um, I have a ninth grader who went through the first year of this, and I have an incoming seventh, seventh grader. My ninth grader sent me so that she wouldn't experience, her younger sister wouldn't experience what she did. Um, it was really a disaster for her. Um, and she has always been good at math. I had a teenage girl saying, I'm good at math. And by February, we had done what I said I would never ever do because I'm not like this. And we hired a tutor. Um, people need to, I mean, maybe it, it never occurred to me, tutors are $130. Um, we're up to 185000 like it's, it's a lot of money. And to do that weekly, you're talking $500, $700 a month. For so many families, that's not a problem. But for so many families, that probably is a real problem. And when we talk about equity and inclusion, we need to include everybody. And that's something we talk about all the time. And so, um, you know, it's the only tutor I've ever hired, and I hope it's the only one I ever do. Um, another thing I'd like to say is on what Ms. Shepherdson said earlier about the professional development. I think part of the reason it was such a disaster is my daughter's teacher wasn't ready or prepared, um, because I know other kids in um, a different group with a different teacher did significantly better. It's a little anecdotal based on what she's reporting to me, but um, it, it's so critical that those teachers, if this is what we do, truly be prepared for all this differentiation, all the um, things we're asking of them when it's already so hard to teach and deal with parents and, you know, all of that. So um, I just wanted to share my experience with that. And, you know, if you do decide to do this, how to make it better. Um, but I really, the, it's the tutoring just upsets me as making this a fair place to live, which is something we've all been working on for the past two years. The board has been working so hard on that, and um, it, I think that's really something critical we all need to think about. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lynn Trotta. I have a daughter in seventh grade. And if you have a child who's a tween, you know that they are very good at picking out discrepancies, right? And what she has come home and said is really um, fascinating to me. So she said things like, how come the school does a land acknowledgement? How come the school teaches about all these awful things that happen to Native Americans, but they're not doing anything to stop what's happening at bottom? How come I have this many weeks long project on the climate crisis, but the school is not saying, hey, look at what we're doing, we're saving all these trees. And with the button hook situation, all I could say to her is, I think they just haven't caught up yet. Because initially the information was, there's nothing there. Totally didn't make sense, right? But now there's new information. And I just have to keep saying, I think it's gonna be okay. Like, they just don't know yet. And when she and I have heard from indigenous elders, when from across the way, not on the bottom of the site, they've pointed out these sacred ceremonial sites, and we have just cried in the process, all I can keep saying is they just haven't found out. They just haven't seen it yet. So again, I just hope that you're able to engage with the indigenous community that is still here and they were excited to have conversations with everyone about this because it is their culture. And like Evelyn said, it's important that we are not continuing the erasure
that is already written about in the history books. We have this really exciting opportunity, this amazing opportunity to have all of us adults be heroes in the child's eyes, not just for them, but for the future generations. from the Chappaqua PTA, and I know there are a lot of very important topics tonight. Um, I really appreciate you all staying late. Um, I did want to address something of importance. Um, the Chappaqua PTA appreciates your commitment to transparency and thoughtfulness in communicating with families about equity and racism. We also want to recognize the board's efforts to seek out more information from the community there were many things raised in the recent BOE focus groups that were too large and too complicated for a one-hour session format. There were also moments that were objectionable, objectionable and offensive to some. Um, we look forward to more opportunities to providing information to the board about student and family experiences and appeal to the board to think through how best to facilitate discussions so all parents and the full range of ideas are included and represented. While I know we are all thinking about this work and its impact on all aspects of the student experience, um, I wanted to highlight a particular value that I could be pretty confident that all parents share. Um, we condemn all expressions of racism, intolerance, and hate. As we know in the quarterly report from the last DOE meeting, incidents are occurring at all levels of our school. We all know that racism is deeper than one individual act and deeper than a single word, but the recurrence of, this, of these things um, shows a lack of evolution in our immediate environment. The PTA trusts in the policies and procedures adopted by the BOE and the administration to handle individual disciplinary actions. We certainly recognize that vilifying any individual in any circumstance is not going to foster open communication and growth on these issues. And while we cannot expect perfection from individual students, teachers, administrators, or ourselves, it is evident that what we have done to date has not equipped our students with the trust turn to adults in the school buildings to appropriately handle racist and hate speech. And that lack of confidence in turn creates more damage and difficulties for students. We are asking for serious thought and actions on refining messages so students are specifically aware of how to react in such a situation. Video recording the commission of hate speech and subsequently spreading that among your peers expands the pain and impact of hate speech and contributes to the further powerlessness felt by many families of color. Obviously, doing nothing is not an option. We want our students to understand that bringing these incidents... Oh. Can I get one more minute? I have a motion to extend the speaker's time by one minute. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, not doing nothing is not an option. We want our students to understand that bringing these incidents quickly and directly to those enabled to address them will limit the damage to the community. Meetings, focus groups, consultants, special events, and professional development are useless if they are only academic and philosophical. It appears to many parents that these efforts are not improving the everyday experience of students. For families of color, we recognize and acknowledge the pain and exhaustion that comes from enduring structural, systemic, and individual racism and the impact of all kinds of hate on a wide range of marginalized groups. For all families, the feeling of unity, connectivity on this issue has not improved, and for some, it has become worse. The PTA wants to respond to the needs of families by expressing their concerns to all of you and we hope we can help you facilitate change. We know that this work can't fall exclusively on you. We want you to appreciate that families are feeling frustrated and disconnected. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Melissa Sinovoy. I have an eighth grader and a sixth grader in this district. And first, I just wanted to thank Adam and Josh. I think you have a really um, comprehensive and deep commitment and understanding to the math curriculum. Can you stick a little closer? Sure. And, and um, did a wonderful job uh, educating us because I came here to be educated, like I said, with some of the this district. Um, my concern is that you know, there is some diversity of opinion here. I, I heard from all four of the Board of Education members concerns, um, speaking with other teachers both within this district and outside of this district and administrators in the math community in very successful school districts. There's certainly um, diversity of opinion. Um, and every single parent who's spoken today has expressed concerns. I, I haven't really heard full support of this endeavor. Um, I wonder whether it would be helpful to include more diverse opinions in making this decision because I felt like from the data, both of you really believe that this, this system from your own experience, from your own um, at, you know, personal education is committed to this single math class. Um, and I wonder whether having someone um, else be able to give a more heterogeneous um, you know, thought process might be helpful. Hello, um, I'm Annette Clearwaters. I am a rising eighth grader. No older children, so I haven't gone through the eighth grade um, higher levels yet. But I want to say I've been fairly hands off and um, happy with the district. And when I started hearing about this program and parents' reactions to it, I became increasingly alarmed. And I made a point to talk to more parents. And I have yet to find anyone even neutral about it. It's been uniformly negative. I mean, I was kind of hoping, coming here tonight, I would hear someone saying, wow, this, this really is great. And the fact that you only have one survey of existing eighth graders with three questions given yesterday, I, I really kind of wonder, have you considered doing a more in-depth survey of the ninth grade kids and their parents? Because it just seems like that would be really helpful. I mean, I really appreciate the presentation and the charts, and obviously the intentions are excellent. Um, but if there's so much negative feedback, then it's hard for me to understand why this is a successful change to a curriculum that, you know, the district was, it's not like it was a struggling district, right? I mean, it's an excellent reputation. So if you're making a change and no other districts are doing it, and parents, you know, this is the second year now, are, in my experience, so uniformly negative. I mean, it just seems odd that you are not um, really surveying those parents and those students who have gone, who have gone through the new program. Um, so I would hope that maybe you'll do more, a better, uh, more comprehensive survey of those people. Thank you. Okay, that I'm guessing concludes public comment. Um, we thank everyone for their public comments. I did not want to do this before everybody got a chance to speak, but I would like to move to take a five minute break, please. A second. All in favor? Uh, we will reconvene in five minutes. Can I have a motion to reopen the meeting? I move to reopen. All in favor? Go back, sorry. I think it might be. Now, it's not like the old one. We've yeah. been really good. This is this one that was needed. Okay, that brings us to approvals and ratifications. Everybody's leaving. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> can I have a motion, please, for items 3.1? Three, 3.5, which is accepting minutes of previous meeting. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Let's just do 3.1 through 3.3, which are accepting the minutes of previous meetings. I will move 3.1 through 3.3. 3. 
I'll second. Um, any questions in the second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Item 3.4 is sure. And 3.5 are policy 6085 and 6090, um, which relate to purchasing, bidding, and purchasing authority. Do you want to? Yeah, I'd like to just talk very, very briefly. Um, the policy committee has been meeting to talk about our purchasing policy um, based in our bidding, in our, our purchasing or bidding policies. There's two of them. We made significant adjustments last year to address some concerns that we had experienced based on past purchasing. And now that we've lived in this for a year, we feel like it's time to revise the policy. There's been some um, steps that we've been engaged in in the operations of the office that aren't necessary. Um, so we're trying to streamline and address what the board needs us to do in terms of communication, but also uh, have a more fluid um, purchasing process in the business office. So you'll see in these two policies, we've made some language changes. And Andrew, do you just want to very briefly summarize for the board what those changes are and how that would prevent um, multiple purchase orders coming to their uh, attention through meetings that require increases. So, so 6085 is, is updated to just match the revised 6090, right? So, so those are what the edits are there, so I'll keep that simple. 6090, we um, made some modifications. Currently, a lot of purchase order increases are coming to the board. The board, in a typical situation, would not need to look at. So what we've done is we've clarified um, the purchasing agent will have the ability to get this deal for five thousand dollars if there's something like a shipping charge change or, or um, you know, a, a price increase for a PO that, that maybe by the time we, we sit at the vendor, the price will change. So that that covers that piece. More importantly, though, and I think in line with the intent of the policy updates that were done last year, is for professional services. We clarify the policy to say that if the board of ed needed to approve the contract, right, then an increase in that purchase order needs to come back to the board of ed, all right? If a change in that contract that maybe would not have needed to go to the board before, now would need to go because of the additional dollars, then that too will come to the board of ed. I think what this will help us do is there's a lot of things being um, gummed up in the works for a technical term because we have to wait for a PO increase. Um, and it's things that typically do not come across the board's desk in the normal course of business. And I think it's caused all these payments, it's caused frustration with, with our staff somewhat, but also the vendors that we work with on a regular basis. So, so I think this keeps the intent of the board updates from last year um, and then just streamlines the process. So maybe our best pathway forward is if you could review the policies and then if you have any suggested language changes to what we've already revised, if you could send that to Hillary Warren and I. So then in our next meeting we can look at that with Andrew and David Shaw. That would be great. I think it's good. I saw that language which I appreciated about the ones that like if something would not have been to us for people, <coughs> like these changes, bump it over the limit. And that's where we have had issues before. So if in its original, if the combination would, should have come to us, now it's going to come to us, and I think that language is good. So I appreciate that. I just want to say thank you. I'll take another look and see if we have this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Four from, uh, I recommend 4.1 instruction. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Do we do it? Yeah. Are you ready? Yep. I recommend 4.1 instruction as presented. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation for 4.1. I will second that. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Okay. I recommend 4.2 now instructional as presented. I move that we, rec we uh, accept the superintendent's recommendation for 4.2. Awesome. Uh, I'll second. Any questions or discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, five brings us to our consent agenda. The use of the consent agenda permits the Board of Education to make a more effective use of its time by adopting a single motion to cover those relatively routine matters which are included. Any member of the Board who wishes to discuss individually a particular piece of business on the consent agenda may so indicate, and that item will be considered and voted on separately. 
that's preserving the right of all board members to be heard on any issue. Um, so before we move the consent agenda, is there anything that anybody wants to remove from it? And I will move the consent agenda, which is item 5.1 through 5.2.2. Do we have any questions for discussion? Yes. Okay. I'd like to uh, discuss. Sorry, I didn't want to resist. I'd like to discuss 5.16. So thank you very much. Uh, just that we're doing intent. We're going to have a traditional graduation. That was, other graduations were traditional. We had graduations in train parking lots and with fireworks. We had a uh, uh, competition field with. Uh, I've never been to a tent graduation. Well, this will be your first That's one. Going back old school. We like it. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm glad we're going back this way. And I think the community appreciate that. I know when a tent goes up, it just that sparks a different type of atmosphere on campus. Thank you, I agree. Exactly. I, 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 are you done? No, no. I just have a quick question, which I did about 5.21 and the increase in the purchase uh, orders for like fuel and gas. Is that just because we don't haven't usually seen that? Is was that is it COVID related? Is it something different? Is it the crazy price of oil? Like what's the uh, situation? It, it's the latter, right? So we were holding off on these increases to see if where we stabilized. Uh, okay. But March, April uh, invoices have been significantly higher yeah. in fuel prices. And okay. what we've done is we've projected that to the end of the year. So we're not going to play catch up with it. It's just to get us through June. Think these will get us to where we need to be. Okay, that's it. That's a good question. Thank you. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, that motion is for 6.1 and 6.2, which are acknowledging contracts approved by Dr. Ackerman for board policy 1685. I move 6.1, 6.2. I'll second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? I think under facilities uh, brings us to financials under eight. Um, eight point one is acknowledgement of the receipt of the claims out of your report from March 2022. Um, eight point two is acknowledging receipt of appropriation status report from March 22. Eight point three is acknowledging receipt of the revenue status report of March 2022. Eight point four is resolved uh, is acknowledging receipt of the treasurer's report from March 2022. And 8.5 is acknowledging receipt of the extra classroom activity fund report for March of 2022. So I will move 8.1 through 8.5. I'll second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. That brings us to modus of future meetings. Our next meeting, I guess, is the school budget vote and election. Um, which is May 17th to Tuesday from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Just a reminder, the vote. only voting places, really, if you're voting in person and not by absentee ballot, you have to come here between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Please vote. The next meeting after that will be Thursday, May 19th at 7.30 p.m. is our tenure teacher recognition night, and we will be back here. I have a question. Okay. Um, this is for the district clerk. Oh. When, when is the last day you can get an absentee ballot? The last day to get an absentee ballot? If you want it mailed to you? If you could pick the mail or pick one up? You can pick one up in person as late as the day before the budget vote. So you can pick it up, just repeat, as late as the day before the election vote? That's correct. If you want it <coughs> mailed to you, then I can only mail it to you seven days ahead of time. So it has to be mailed. Uh, so your absentee ballot request must be to me by May 10th if you wish for me to mail you a ballot. So a, a, if you have an absentee ballot mailed to you, it has to be at your desk by May 10th. The ballot application, yes. Correct. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I move that we adjourn this meeting at 10.58 p.m. I second. 
Any questions? All in favor? Aye. We are adjourned.